artists look at roads by richard f weingroff from public roads magazine summer 1996 volume 60 number one a publication of the u.s department of transportation federal highway administration this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Because roads, streets, highways, boulevards, and freeways are an inescapable part of our life, they understandably are part of our art. In the foreground or the background, they anchor our art to reality, serve as symbols, or twist and turn in ways never dreamed by an engineer john weedenhammer for example began including roads in all his paintings following a private showing of his work in st louis missouri in 1969 along with his other work he exhibited a few road pictures every one of which sold in a 1989 profile of the artist southwest art described his work Though the landscape may change, John Wiedenhammer's paintings always have it in common, namely a road. Whether it be a tire-marked sandy pathway snaking through boulders, or an asphalted two-lane strip that carves up endless expanses of pasture. Asked why he puts such a mundane subject, roads, in all his paintings, Wiedenhammer responded, quote, Roads are what America is all about. Our history as an economic and social power is due in part to the incredible road system that ties the coasts of this country together and allows commerce and social exchange to take place even in the most remote areas mobility and the automobile are a large part of it if we had to travel to the grand canyon on horseback how many of us would ever get there End quote. Quote, no matter what your destination, the roadway is really what you see during most of your trip, End quote, he added as a practical matter. His paintings are free of cars, crowds of people, and the bustle of traffic. He may leave the road signs, but he removes the litter. A collector once asked Wiedenhammer where he found roads of such peace in America, Wiedenhammer told Southwest Art, quote, The collector is a busy developer and doesn't have time to travel. If he did, he'd realize that there are endless places of peace along the back roads if we just take time to look for them. End quote. Other artists, unlike Wiedenhammer, like to paint the freeways that in many ways intersect with our lives and symbolize the urban sensibility of our age. Detroit artist Lowell Boileau has painted a series of paintings of his city's freeway network. The Fisher Freeway Bridge arches over the Rouge River. Westbound traffic on the Ford Freeway nears the Goodyear sign. Rush hour on the Lodge Freeway. Bumper to bumper traffic southbound on the Chrysler Freeway. One painting, called Lunch Break, shows construction workers at lunch on a freeway ramp connecting the Ruther to the Chrysler and displays the towering I-696 overpass. These are part of more than 20 paintings of expressways done by Boileau. Quote, I like expressways. They have particular lines, smooth, curving lines, like giant sculptures. They make human movement a kind of flow of electrons. There's that aesthetic thing of design that also points out social ironies. Escape to the suburbs, a conduit flying in and flying out, end quote, said Boileau in a profile published in the Detroit Freeway Press in 1986. But perhaps the best-known painter of freeways is Wayne Thiebaud, who is known for his paintings of everyday objects, candy machines, ice cream cones, bowls of soup, a desk set. One of his paintings is called Five Hammers, another Pies, Pies, Pies. They depict literally 
five hammers and several pies although the paintings have a pop sensibility thibault responds quote, i see myself as a traditional painter i'm very much interested in the concept of realism and the notion of inquiry into what the tradition of realism is all about End quote. in nineteen seventy three thibault purchased a home on potrero hill in san francisco not far from his front door across utah street and a concrete wall is u s route one o one u s one o one was the inspiration for a number of the works soon he began painting the railroads bridges piers and warehouses he could see from the hill and then the city beyond his view quote, i was fascinated by those plunging streets end quote, he said his drawing toward 280 1978 and his painting freeway exit 1975 are early examples toward 280 a view of the elevated i-280 freeway has been described as showing quote, the city's maze-like topography and the dynamic thrusts and counter thrusts of its streets buildings and freeways end quote. in other paintings thibault has taken a closer look at the automobiles freeways and commuter traffic of the city examples are freeway exit 1975 freeways 1978 urban freeways 1979-80 san francisco freeway 1980-81 and freeway traffic 1983 thibault based the paintings on observation and memory but rearranged the elements to fit the pattern of his vision although freeways are as real as any object in our lives thibault's freeways combine elements of the representational and the caricature a recent study prepared in conjunction with a traveling exhibit of thibault's work described urban freeways in this painting thibault presents an abstracted concept of freeways those labyrinthine entanglements of cement for which california is famous although the painting incorporates numerous representational elements buildings cars trees smokestacks they are subordinated to the baroque maze of shapes that snake curl and cut across the canvas the painting is a caricature of the notion of freeway rendered in an exaggerated composition of arabesques unlike Wiedenhammer, thibault is not seeking quote, peace along the back roads end quote. he fills his urban streets and freeways with their normal traffic of cars trucks and buses except that the city streets are sometimes so steep that they appear more suitable for an amusement park than an urban road network and the vehicles often appear to be overwhelmed in a city of giant intersecting freeways and hills too steep to traverse the recent study described the vehicles in his urban landscapes as quote, tiny and bug-like tentatively and uncomfortably poised on steep hillside streets end quote as with Wiedenhammer, the question about Thibault's freeway paintings is whether the subject is really suitable for art. Thibault dismisses the issue. He deliberately chooses the everyday objects of our life for his subjects. Quote, I'm interested in the dignity of the thing, the object so long as it has some sort of genuineness, end quote, he told an interviewer. Quote, when my students worry about what to paint, I tell them what the novelist James Joyce said, that any object deeply contemplated may represent a window on the universe. There's really only one study, and that is how things relate and interrelate. End, quote. End of Artists Look at Roads by Richard F. Weingroff Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson. Barrier Beaches of the Atlantic Coast 
by Frederick J. H. Merrill, reprinted from the Popular Science Monthly for October 1890. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Cape Cod to Cape Florida, our coast is fringed with barrier beaches. They are the reefs of sand which protect the mainland shore from the storm waves of the ocean. Isolated and uninhabited were most of these seaborne barriers for a long period in the history of our country, but the need of a breathing place on the part of the thousands who inhabit our crowded cities has caused within a few years a great transformation. Railroad and turnpike bridges have been built, connecting many of them with the shore. Hotels and cottages, clubhouses and bathing houses, in short, buildings for every purpose, which contributes to the pleasure and comfort of man, have sprung up, as it were, by magic, on the south shore of Long Island, on the coast of New Jersey, Virginia, and the Carolinas, on the famed sea islands of Georgia, and on the coast of eastern Florida. Much alike are these peninsulas and islands wherever we view them along the coast. The chief variation is in the vegetation which clothes them. The beaches of Long Island are almost barren, but from New Jersey southward many are covered with dense forests which vary in their trees according to the latitude. At Sandy Hook, oaks, red cedars, hollies, maples, and sassafras trees grow in wonderful luxuriance. On Seven Mile Beach and Holly Beach, the swamp magnolia abounds among the others. In the Carolinas, the palmetto appears, often ragged in outline and blighted by the winter frosts. In northern Florida, the palmettos are more numerous and show the influence of a warmer climate, while on the southern extremity of the zone of barrier beaches, the coconut palm, planted by accident or design, rears its leafy crown in luxuriant verdure. It is not the design of the writer to describe in detail the beaches of the Atlantic coast, but rather to consider their history and mode of growth. As it has been his fortune to spend much time on the seashore of New Jersey, he proposes to discuss the barrier beaches of that state as types of their genus. They are sandy islands and peninsulas from two to twenty miles in length and from half a mile to a mile in width, separated by inlets and usually divided from the mainland by an interval of several miles, in which are broad expanses of salt meadow fringing and separating a series of channels, bays, and sounds. The beaches which are now in their highest state of development are Sandy Hook, Seven Mile Beach, and Holly Beach near Cape May. These typical examples of the seaborne barriers are much alike in structure and consist of four principal divisions. The first division, or interior, is an undulating area covered with heavy timber, of which the size suggests its age. Immense hollies, oaks, pines, and red cedars abound, many of the first measuring two feet in diameter, and some of the latter attaining a circumference of four or five yards. The sassafras grows in remarkable luxuriance, and immense grapevines are everywhere to be seen, overhanging a dense undergrowth. In spring and summer the ground is covered with fragrant blossoms, columbines, violets, pinks, orchids, and a host of other flowers lend their bright colors to enhance the varied greens of the foliage. This is the beech primeval. Skirting it seaward is the second division, which bears smaller timber. Low cedars, hollies, and pines are here the chief forms of arboreal vegetation, and fewer flowering plants are seen. This zone is of later formation, and its trees are younger than those of the first. Adjoining it is the third division, which consists of a belt of undulating dunes a few hundred feet or yards in width, and bearing the mossy Hudsonia or scrubby bushes of beech plum and wax myrtle, or in some places, especially on the outer row of dunes, only supporting a meager growth of beech grass. Frequently between two rows of dunes an expanse of salt meadow occurs, or a sand flat bearing stunted forms of plant life. With this third division ends the domain of vegetation, succeeded by the sloping strand upon which the tide rises and falls. The sandbar, exposed at low water at the extremity of the beach, is constantly increased in length and height by the action of the currents, and the process of beach formation is here continually in progress. As the tide falls, the sand laid bare is rapidly dried by the wind and carried above high water mark. 
Then, safe beyond the reach of the waves, the minute particles are borne still farther from the water, and striking against some piece of driftwood, bush, or tuft of grass, quickly build a hillock, which grows larger and larger as more sand falls upon it, and a dune is formed many feet in height. The material of which these dunes are composed is never at rest, but flies hither and thither with the wind, and a hillock ten or fifteen feet high today may noiselessly be taken down tomorrow and rebuilt a hundred yards away. In time, as the beach grows seaward and the dunes increase in number, those of earlier formation, which are somewhat protected from the breeze, catch a few seeds, and tufts of grass begin to grow upon them. Still later, the mossy Hudsonia, or some starveling wax myrtle, finds a little sustenance, and as years elapse, the dunes become so thickly covered with vegetation that under the protection of the seaward hillocks, they retain their form with comparatively little change. Thus have the beaches grown. First, a sand flat built by ocean waves and currents, then a series of low, shifting dunes. Next, sheltered hillocks, on which grasses and shrubs fasten their protecting roots, succeeding the latter, a growth of small cedars and pines, and finally, as centuries roll on, majestic forest trees raise their spreading tops and shelter a dense undergrowth. These few words suffice to describe the beach's growth, their physiology but many pages might be written about their history, the details of their development, their changes, and their decay. Unfortunately, the records are but incomplete. From the memories of old men, we can glean some facts in regard to the former condition and extent of certain beaches, and concerning marked changes in them, which have been notable events to men of quiet lives. In a few instances, surveys were made a century or two ago, which can be compared with those of today. At present, we can watch the changes which occur from year to year. As geological science advances, we can speculate concerning the past on the basis of present knowledge and observation. We have little accurate information, but after all, we have much that is interesting. The beach of Sandy Hook forms the northern extremity of the New Jersey seacoast. Previous to 1778, it was connected with the base of the Navasink Highlands by a sandy isthmus the mouths of the Navasink and Shrewsbury Rivers being open to the east, but from that date until about 1830, and from 1848 until 1889, it has been united with the mainland at Monmouth Beach by a narrow strip of sand. According to records in the Office of the Surveyor General of East Jersey and in that of the United States Coast Survey, the point of Sandy Hook advanced northward about one mile between 1685 and 1885. The lighthouse was built about 1764, near the water's edge, and the ground on which it stands had then existed for only 15 years as a portion of terra firma. In 1844, the point was about 250 yards north of its present limit. Since that date, it has receded slowly toward the south, and toward the west has extended a quarter of a mile. We have no evidence concerning the date of formation of the old hook, which existed before 1685. It is now well marked by immense forest trees, which exceed in height and size of trunk any of their species known to the writer in the neighborhood of New York. The rapid growth of Sandy Hook is due to a current which flows northward from the vicinity of Manasquan, carrying with it a great quantity of sand removed from the waterfront of Asbury Park, Long Branch, Seabright, and that vicinity, which is dropped along the border of the Hook and its extremity. The investigations of the United States Coast and Geodetic Survey have shown that the ebb and flow of the tides from and to New York Bay produce this current by drawing a stream of water through False Hook Channel, which lies between Sandy Hook and a submerged bar called False Hook, half a mile to the east. The stream flows northward more than seven hours out of twelve, and from this fact property owners in the neighborhood of Long Branch may appreciate what becomes of their real estate when it disappears during the storms. If there were any means of identifying the soil, it might all be found on the rapidly growing point of Sandy Hook. About 1778, a channel was opened across the narrow isthmus which united Sandy Hook with the base of Navasink Highlands, and a new passage being thus afforded for the tidal currents 
of the Navasink and Shrewsbury rivers, the old Shrewsbury inlet, which formed the common mouth of these two estuaries, was gradually closed by the northward extension of the sand spit, which formed from the southern limit, and in 1810 became impassable. The barrier thus formed existed until 1830 or 1831, when it was broken through and a second inlet was created. By a change in the tidal currents, due to the formation of this new inlet, the isthmus which formerly connected Sandy Hook with the highlands of Navasink was again brought into existence and remained until 1835. An artificial channel was then cut through it, and this being gradually deepened and widened by the ebb and flow of the tides, has ever since remained open. The second Shrewsbury Inlet closed in 1840 near Island Beach, having moved northward nearly three miles during its existence of nine or ten years. In 1837 or 1838, the third and last inlet opened near the present Bellevue Hotel and afforded a better channel for navigation than the second inlet, which it followed in its northward course and survived by about eight years. From 1848 until September 1889, no inlet has been opened. But this fact is due rather to the efforts of the railroad company to maintain its roadbed than to a diminution of the tendency of the waves and tidal currents to open a passage. The facts and dates concerning the Shrewsbury Inlets have been obtained chiefly by inquiry from old fishermen and sailors who have spent their lives on or near the waters of the Navasink and Shrewsbury Rivers. Coming from a number of independent sources, they agree very closely, and those here given may be accepted as worthy of credence. The tendency of the inlets to work northward, periodically closing and reopening farther south, has been observed in all those between Point Pleasant and Sandy Hook, especially in those of Manasquan and Shark Rivers. Between Point Pleasant and Cape May, however, all the inlets are moving southward. From Monmouth to the head of Barnegat Bay, there is no beach similar to that of Sandy Hook. Instead of a sand reef separated from the mainland by a navigable channel, there is only the sloping strand adjoining, as at Long Branch, the foot of an upland bluff, or as at Spring Lake, Seagirt, and Point Pleasant, with its crest on a level with the surface of the upland. Between Bayhead and Cape May, however, there are twelve beaches, mostly well developed and preserved and named respectively Squan, Island, Long, Island or Little, Brigantine, Apsicon, Pex, Ludlums, Seven Mile, Five Mile or Holly, Two Mile, and Poverty. The majority of these, however, do not show the high degree of development exhibited by Seven Mile and Five Mile beaches. Some appear to be only in the earlier stages of growth, while others have passed their prime and are now yielding to the attacks of wind and wave. These agents have been hitherto considered only with reference to their constructive effort on the beaches, and it now remains to consider their destructive action. When the wind blows from the west, it carries back to the sea much of the sand which the east wind had piled up in dunes, and but for the fact that the latter wind prevails, the sand hills would not long exist. By a surplus of constructive action, however, the beaches are all moving to the west, Year after year, sand is removed from their eastern margin by the winter storms and carried north or south according to the direction of the prevailing current. The winds from the ocean drive the dunes westward, and with the possible exception of Sandy Hook, all the beaches are now underlaid by an old salt meadow, originally formed in sheltered waters on their west side. In this turf, when exposed during an unusually low tide, the footprints of cattle are seen in many places made, it is claimed, when the salt meadow was a pasture and lay on the shoreward side of the beach. This westward recession has, in many cases, amounted to more than a mile within two centuries. On the many beaches south of Point Pleasant, the westward progress of the dunes has been made over and through the native forest. As a result of this, gnarled cedars, dying and dead, are found among the dunes and in many cases stumps may be seen in the sand within reach of the tide. Near the northern end of Seven Mile Beach, at the time of the writer's visit in 1885, an immense dune, 40 feet in height and half a mile in length, had been for many years encroaching steadily upon the dense forest. The treetops here projected above the summit of the ridge like the heads of drowning men above the waves, while on the outer flank of the overwhelming mass of sand 
the gnarled, skeleton trunks of those which had perished in it stood bare and grim, showing with dreary grayness the fate of the earlier victims of which the ragged and wave-worn stumps alone remained. A more desolate scene the writer has never witnessed. At Long Branch, the wear of the coast has been very great. According to the United States Coast and Geodetic Survey, a strip of land varying from 300 to 500 feet in width was removed between Deal Beach and Monmouth during the 27 years preceding 1868. In the vicinity of Seabright, the amount of wear was a little less than 200 feet during that period. Of late years, the rate of recession has been diminished in the neighborhood of Long Branch by the means of artificial protection employed, but near Seabright, the shoreline is said to have receded at least 200 feet during the past quarter of a century. At Cape May, the wear of the shore has been continuous, except where the land is protected by jetties or a stone seawall, the rate of encroachment varying from 10 to 30 feet a year. Besides these alterations produced in the beaches by their westward progress, the variations in the positions of the inlets and the subsidence of the coast have caused many important changes. The history of the Shrewsbury Inlets has already been given. It remains to mention a few of those south of Point Pleasant. Squan and Island Beaches, which now form a peninsula about 20 miles long, terminating at Barnegat Inlet, were separated from 1750 to 1812 by Cranberry Inlet, which was nearly opposite the mouth of Tom's River. Since 1812, near the site of this old inlet, there have been others of brief duration, and one is said to have existed before 1755 opposite the mouth of the Matidakunk River, which separated Squan Beach from the mainland. The old Barnegat Lighthouse is said to have stood nearly 600 yards north of the present south shore of the inlet, at a point now occupied by the center of the channel. In 1855, the old tower was at the water's edge, so that the inlet has moved southward approximately 20 yards per year. Absecon Inlet, which separates Brigantine Beach from Absecon Beach, has encroached upon the latter about 400 yards in 20 years, and the ocean front of that portion of Absecon Beach, which is occupied by Atlantic City, extended in 1855 nearly half a mile farther east than it did in 1885. About 1875, jetties were built which arrested the action of the tidal currents, and the wear of the shore being thus prevented, a considerable area was restored. Submerged tree stumps and other evidences of a subsidence of the coast may be found on the beaches and the salt meadows, but a detailed enumeration of them would be beyond the scope of the present article. In Cape May County, the depression has not been less than 20 feet, and has possibly been much greater. The evidence of some old buildings on the shore of Delaware Bay suggests a subsidence of about four feet during the last two centuries. It is doubtful whether depression alone has caused the wear of the coast. A comparison of the present outline of Holly Beach with that determined by a survey in 1772 shows an accretion on the south and east since the latter date, more than three and a half miles long and averaging three-eighths of a mile in width and on many other beaches a similar growth has taken place. During the past five years, the ocean has rapidly encroached upon these beaches, while the subsidence of the coast, so far as we know, has been uniform throughout the past two centuries. It would appear, therefore, that the growth and decay of the beaches are more dependent upon the action of the ocean currents and winds than upon other agencies. Unquestionably, the depression of the coast renders the beaches more subject to overflow and erosion by the waves and currents, but the evidence at many points shows that the latter are capable of forming large areas of beach where the conditions of their existence and action favor construction rather than destruction. While these currents act as at present, the cost of preventing the ravages of the sea by the methods commonly in use would probably be much greater than the value of the land protected for the fine sand is so unstable when wet that bulkheads and breakwaters are quite ephemeral. After an extended examination of the various systems of shore defense in use between Sandy Hook and Cape May, it appears to the writer that the only effectual means of protection is the construction of jetties extending far enough from the shore to intercept the currents, which carry away the sand loosened by the waves. Such jetties have added a large area to the territory of Atlantic City, and have protected the shore at Cape May. No doubt they would be effective everywhere 
if properly constructed. The experience of the past 10 years on the New Jersey coast shows conclusively that the oceanfront is not fit for building purposes, for it is impossible to protect a house near the water's edge from injury or destruction in the heaviest storms. The height and force of the waves in such a tempest as that of September 10 and 11, 1889, render them irresistible to any body or structure which nature or art has yet produced, and anything within their reach must suffer. The immediate waterfront is only available for parks, and if devoted to this use when protected from the erosive action of the currents by suitable jetties, would remain a neutral ground which, in fair weather, would afford numberless attractions to the occupants of dwellings placed far enough from the strand to be out of reach of the storm waves. Property owners along the ocean front of the beaches have generally made the mistake of supposing that the domain of the Atlantic was bounded by the high water mark of the spring tides. Anyone who should build a dwelling on the strand below ordinary high water mark would be considered lacking in common sense, yet it is scarcely less foolish to build within reach of the storm waves. It is, of course, true that many cottages are now much nearer the water's edge than they were a few years ago. This is due to the wear of the shore by currents already described as flowing parallel to it and removing the sand which the waves have loosened. If the action of these currents should be stopped, and there is good evidence to show that a system of jetties would intercept them and cause them to drop their stolen load of sand, the wear of the shore would be arrested and the yearly encroachments of the ocean would cease. With regard to the inundation of Atlantic City by the sea in the great September storm of 1889, it should be said that this catastrophe ought not to be considered very wonderful, since the greater portion of the city is less than 10 feet above mean tide, and the highest point recorded by the New Jersey State Survey is only 13 feet above that level. As ordinary tides rise a foot above this plain and spring tides nearly two feet, it is evident that a prolonged easterly storm would soon cause a considerable area to be overflowed. Since the bays and channels which lie between the beach and the mainland are almost completely landlocked and the inlets are relatively narrow, the water level is soon raised to a height of two or three feet above the meadows, and this is sufficient to cover most of the railroad tracks. To be sure, no such inundation as the recent one has occurred since Atlantic City became a place of importance, nor do the old residents on the coast remember such a storm in former years. But it is evident that, while the beaches were uninhabited, such a storm as the one in question would attract less attention, since it would cause little, if any, loss of property. The genesis of the beaches is still a matter for speculation, but it may be safely affirmed that they originated as sandbars formed underwater by wave and current action. How these bars were brought above water so that the wind could exert its constructive power is uncertain. A plausible hypothesis is that while the ocean was breaking on the mainland shore and forming the quaternary terraces, which may be seen there, sandbars were made underwater, and that the continental elevation which raised these terraces to their present position from 25 to 80 feet above tide brought these sandbars above water into a horizon of aeolian action. Once above the sea, the beaches would maintain their existence. A continued elevation of the coast would add to their seaward extent, and a depression would cause a westward recession until they were brought to rest by contact with the mainland shore. In New Jersey, the latter condition may be observed between Long Branch and Point Pleasant, and also at Cape May. So far as it is known to the writer, the only way in which a beach can be entirely destroyed is by an inlet shifting its position. In this case, the beach obliterated is replaced by the extension of an adjacent beach. Of the beaches south of New Jersey, not enough is known to the writer to permit of a detailed biographical sketch. Their form and structure show that they have been subject to the same formative agencies and vicissitudes as those already described. In addition to the Georgia Sea Islands of antebellum fame may be mentioned as familiar examples the barriers which in Virginia and North Carolina separate Albemarle and Pamlico sounds from the ocean. In Florida, Amelia Island, on which is built the city of Fernandina, Anastasia Island in front of St. Augustine, and the beaches which separate Halifax and Indian rivers from the Atlantic. The last named rivers are the lagoons which separate the barriers from the mainland shore. 
Lake Worth is one of these lagoons of which the inlet has been closed. To what extent the Florida Keys may be included in the category of barrier beaches must be decided by future investigation. Key West is evidently a wave-built sandbar composed of fragments of coral, molluscan shells, and foraminifera, and it seems likely that Cayo Largo and others of that type may be of similar origin. The coquina deposits of the vicinity of St. Augustine are also wave-formed. The hypothesis of Professor Louis Agassiz that the Florida Keys are all of organic origin, that is, that they were formed by the growth of coral reefs, may be true so far as the determination of their location and direction. A submerged reef of coral may have formed a nucleus on which the waves and currents deposited a load of calcareous sand, but the superficial portion is evidently similar in origin to that of the beaches farther north. Barrier beaches are found on all the sea coasts of the world where opportunity for their growth has been afforded, and those of New Jersey may be regarded as types of these formations in all their essential features. End of Barrier Beaches of the Atlantic Coast by Frederick J. H. Merrill An excerpt from One of the Pioneer Women in Medicine by her daughter, Lucy Seaman Bainbridge. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the early spring of 1860, a lady from Ohio was visiting an eastern city. She called at the house of a clergyman whose home had previously been in her own city and who had left a smaller charge for a large and influential church. Handing to the maid her card, which read as follows, C. A. Seaman, M. D., 65 Seneca Street, Cleveland, she patiently waited. The reverend gentleman in his study received the card, glanced at it, and for the moment forgot all the many courtesies he had received from the family of that lady, forgot all the hospitality which she had extended to him and his family when they moved from the western city to the eastern one. In his narrow vision he could only see woman as a drudge. So taking up the card, he penciled on the back, I refuse to see any woman who has so unsexed herself as to study medicine. Ten years before the occurrence of this incident, Elizabeth Blackwell had, in the face of great criticism, blazed the trail for every woman in the study of medicine. Her sister Emily and a few others followed in her footsteps. The world moves on, and the few men and women who would hold back the line of advance have not the ability to retard the onward sweep of progress. The sketch of a noble and progressive woman begins in 1814, when she first opened her blue eyes upon life near the College of Middlebury, Vermont, in the home of Lucy Boynton and Levi Stevens. The name of that baby, the doctor said, should be Cleopatra the Queen. It was too long, too fanciful, but by omitting the pat she was called Cleora Augusta. In those early days before the time of radiators and steam heat, there was in the living room a large open fire with kettle and crane. A sleepy nurse allowed little Cleora to roll off her lap into the burning embers, with the result that to the day of her death she was badly scarred from her neck to the end of her spine. Tended on a pillow and lovingly cared for, her life was saved. When the baby was a few years old, the family migrated by coach and canal, there were no railroad trains, to the village of Rochester, New York. The two black-eyed older sisters were sent to a boarding school, in those days called a female seminary, but the blue-eyed Cleora was too frail to go away from home, so she studied largely by herself under the tutelage of her cousin, John Stevens, who afterward founded Denison University in Ohio and was professor of Latin and Greek for many years in that institution. The village of Rochester, as with many new towns, had a few names which stood out very prominently, and one of these was that of Old Deacon Sage, leader in the manufacture of boots and shoes, for which that city is now famous. A young man in the deacon's home learned the trade thoroughly, and as the cry on the part of the older people was, Go West, young man, go West, this young man, John Seaman, and his seventeen-year-old bride, Cleora, ten years his junior, started by lumbering stagecoach for the distant village of Cleveland, Ohio, its population at that time being a little over a thousand. 
the bride must have made a very pretty picture in her green calash bonnet made of silk and whalebone that folded up accordion fashion like a buggy top and a mantilla or pelisse to match as homekeeper and one of the leaders of the choir as teacher in sunday school and president of the maternal association this young woman kept busy the young man prospered in business he was known as honest john at his death years afterward it was said by leading businessmen quote, not one grain of smut has ever touched the character of john seaman unquote. one after another there came to their home seven children of which the writer was the only daughter all during the years of rearing her children, Mrs. Seaman was constantly studying. In a book written by Mrs. W. A. Ingham, entitled Women of Cleveland, she says, quote, Mrs. Seaman was always reading medical works, seeking health at a water cure where she had access to the physician's library. She was many years in advance of her time, unquote. Hydropathy was the medical subject of highest interest in that day, and in her earnest efforts for the health of her boys, they were obliged every morning to take a shower bath by turning a pail of water over themselves, even though they had to break the ice which had formed overnight. It must be remembered that there were no bathtubs with hot water appliances or tile lined heated bathrooms in those days. In the attic, there were all manner of braces which had been urged upon her growing children so that they would have strong bodies and straight spines. Perhaps the boys, with their ice water shower baths, and the daughter upon whom was tried various spinal adjustments, did not sympathize as much as they should have, for one of the memories of the latter is the writing of a school composition on Our Attic, showing only the humorous side of the discarded braces and cure-alls. Before the days of the almost limitless array of breakfast foods, when sausage and cakes or ham and eggs were the usual early morning meal, this woman, who was ahead of her time, studied food values and realized that whole wheat was a health food for growing children. She had to hunt up a mill and there bought the wheat, the whole kernel, then improvised a sort of double boiler, one kettle within another. In this boiler, the wheat was slowly cooked on the back of the stove from 36 to 48 hours. When served with cream, it was more delicious than any breakfast food ever invented. The Plain Dealer of Cleveland records in November 1852, quote, a large meeting of ladies in the old stone church, who after some discussion agreed to form a permanent society for the encouragement of medical education among women. A constitution was adopted and a board of management elected, of which Mrs. John Seaman was a member, unquote. In the winter of 1857 and 1858, Mrs. Seaman was very much out of health and was sent to Philadelphia for special treatment at a water cure. Such institutions are called, in England, hydros. As she had never been given to light reading or fancy work, the physician in charge was at a loss to know what to allow his patient to do between treatments. Within walking distance was the Women's Medical College, founded in 1850. There, she had access to a medical library and having studied at home, she could make good use of it and could appreciate the lectures. The regular exercise and the agreeable companionship added to the medical treatments resulted in a measure of health and strength. Mrs. Seaman returned to her home to meet the sorrow of the death of one of her children. With no thought of a medical degree, Mr. Seaman worked out with his wife the following plan which would help her to regain her strength and interest her. Each day she was driven to the Western Homeopathic College, the only one in Cleveland, then, which would admit a woman to its lectures. In a tiny gallery were placed a comfortable armchair and footstool with drapery adjusted at the sides. The male students would look up and smile and joke about their guardian angel. However, they were still happier when they were invited to 65 Seneca Street to quiz in anatomy and other branches and then stay for one of her bountiful suppers. Early in 1860, 18 young men and Mrs. Seaman received the degree of Doctor of Medicine. The study of hydropathy naturally led to an interest in and study of medical electricity. The libraries undoubtedly were searched by her for information about this unknown power for good or ill. It is easy to imagine that in her quest, she went back to the first manifestation recorded in 600 B.C., when by rubbing amber heads together, the mystery of electricity was manifested. Doubtless she had read that quaint old book, The Ethereal Physician, and its recorded experiments. Previous to that, in 1759, the wise old divine, John Wesley, wrote a pamphlet entitled 
the desideratum, or electricity made plain by a lover of mankind and common sense. Most of those writing later of electricity spoke of seven methods of employing it, electric bath, drawing sparks by aeration, friction, insufflation, exhaustion, and commotion. Realizing how little she knew of an inexhaustible subject, Mrs. Seaman kept to the efficiency of the bath. An intelligent young man in the telegraph office near her home, who knew more than his dots and dashes, was interested and most helpful. Mrs. Seaman had been most successful in relieving pain and reducing inflammation of swollen joints in her own family. Her husband, who was interested in all her efforts, was ready to add a wing to their house, and Mrs. Seaman installed a bathtub for the use of electricity and water, the first one of its kind in Ohio, so far as could be learned. For a time it was much talked about, but Mrs. Seaman's record for doing good warded off any attempts to ridicule her and her venture. An educated young lady helped in the practical working of the scheme, and now, at an advanced age, writes from her home in California, quote, Mrs. Seaman was a grand woman, and how beautiful in appearance. She worked for souls as well as bodies, and a host of ailing females, knowing her love for medicine, and realizing not only her sympathy but her ability, came to her for relief in the troubles peculiar to women, unquote. There was no sign, no card, no advertising, but the sufferers came. At first, no charge was made, but later it was deemed wise to have those patients who were quite able to pay carry with Mrs. Seaman the expense of the work for the poor. One illustration from among many will suffice. The garden at 65 Seneca Street went through to Academy Lane, on which were homes of smaller pretense. In one of these homes lived an English butcher and his wife. He went to work necessarily very early in the morning, leaving his wife in bed, a confirmed and helpless invalid, called by several doctors quite incurable. Neighbors did all they could. Mrs. Seaman found her out, visited her, and later had her carried over to a chamber, which was called the Lord's Room, in the home at 65 Seneca Street. Someone was always in that room, either a poor student studying for the ministry, or someone in sorrow or sick, like Mrs. Cromack, the butcher's wife, who was lifted into the electric bathtub each day and was well cared for. Gradually her bodily conditions were so changed that instead of her ankles being drawn up to her hips and she unable to get up, the poor sufferer was able to walk with crutches and had but little pain. At the funeral of Mrs. Seaman, one of her truest mourners was Mrs. Cromack, then a widow, who could walk comfortably with the help of a cane. Quote, in the late sixties, women students were excluded from the classes of the medical college, and as a result, a women's college was organized and chartered in 1868. But in 1870, writes Dr. Hamilton Bigger, a well-known physician of Ohio, the college again opened its doors to women by a majority of one vote. Of course, each man thus voting for the admission always claimed that it was his vote which did it. The women then transferred their property to the Cleveland Hospital College, unquote. It was largely through the untiring zeal and influence of Mrs. Seaman that when the doors of the college were closed to women, a woman's college was promptly started, and she was made the first president and one of the professors. In the winter of 1867, a class of 40 intelligent, earnest women were enrolled as students. In the first annual announcement of this new college, we read, quote, Mrs. C. A. Seaman, who has been widely known these many years as being most successful in the treatment of chronic diseases peculiar to her sex, will, in connection with the Chair of Theory and Practice, deliver a course of lectures on the therapeutic uses of electricity which will, together with the clinical advantages to be derived from her extensive practice and complete electrical apparatus for the employment of baths, etc., afford unparalleled facilities for the study of this most important auxiliary in the treatment of chronic diseases generally and women especially." Unquote. In the second annual announcement in the spring of 1869 was the following, quote, The semen free dispensary has been established by the first president of the college, Mrs. C. A. Seaman, M.D. It occupies a room in the college building and is under control of the faculty. As this is open every day and is largely attended, it becomes a daily clinic of very great importance, 
Indeed, the clinical advantages in every department, embracing, as it does, an unlimited range of practice, is one of the distinguishing features of this college. Each student will have ample opportunity for practical study at public clinics and at the bedside, unquote. Mrs. Seaman passed on into the eternal life at daybreak, 1869. End of an excerpt from One of the Pioneer Women in Medicine by Lucy Seaman Bainbridge. Domestic French Cookery by Sulpice Barouet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pastry, Cakes, etc. French Paste. Sift a quart of flour and lay it in a pan. Make a hole in the middle and put into it the white of an egg slightly beaten, a piece of butter the size of an egg, and a very little salt. Pour in gradually as much cold water as will moisten it. Mix it well with your hands as rapidly as possible and see that no lumps are left in it. Set it away to cool and in a quarter of an hour roll it out and spread over it half a pound of butter which has been kept in ice. Then fold up the paste with the four sides laid one over another so as entirely to enclose the butter and set it for half an hour in a cool place. Then roll it again, fold it, and give it another roll. Set it away again, and in half an hour, roll it out twice more, and it will be fit for use. Puff paste may be made with a pound of butter and a pound and a quarter of sifted flour. The butter must be washed in cold water and then squeezed very hard and made up into a lump. Divide it into eight parts. Mix one part of the butter with the flour, adding just enough water to moisten it. Roll it out, spread over it a second portion of the butter, flour it, fold it up, and roll it out again, adding another division of the butter. Repeat this till you get in all the butter a piece at a time, folding and rolling the paste with each separate portion of the butter. Then set it away to cool. If it sets several hours, it will be the better for it, and better still if the paste is made the night before it is wanted, always keeping it in a cold place. While buttering and rolling, do everything as quickly as possible. Before you put it into the dishes, roll it out once more. It is difficult in warm weather to make good puff paste without a marble table or slab to roll it on. Cream Tarts Mix together a quart of flour, half a pound of butter, a little salt, and two beaten eggs. Add a little cold water, make it into a paste, and set it away to cool. Then roll it out again. Cut it into round shapes with the edge of a tumbler. Lay round each a rim made of an even strip of the paste and notch it handsomely. Bake them for a quarter of an hour and then take them from the oven. Beat together a pint of cream, four eggs, and four tablespoonfuls of powdered sugar. Fill the tarts with this mixture, grate nutmeg over each, and bake them again for a quarter of an hour. Almond Tarts Blanch half a pound of shelled sweet almonds and three ounces of shelled bitter almonds. Beat them a few at a time in a mortar, mixing them well, and adding at times a little rose water. When done, mix with them a quarter of a pound of loaf sugar powdered and the juice and grated peel of half a lemon. Have ready some fine paste. Cut it into circular pieces about the size and thickness of a dollar. Put into each piece of paste some of the almond mixture heaping it up in the center. Cover them with lids of the same and crimp the edges very neatly. Bake them about half an hour and grate sugar over them when done. Rizoles. Make some fine paste and cut it out with the edge of a tumbler. Have ready some minced veal, seasoned in the best manner, or some chopped oysters, or any sort of force meat, and lay some of it on one half of each piece of paste. Then turn over it the other half, so as to enclose the meat. Crimp the edges, put some butter into a frying pan, lay the rissoles into it, and fry them of a light brown. They should be in the shape of a half moon. Almond Custards Blanch and pound in a mortar half a pound of shelled sweet almonds and three ounces of peach kernels or shelled bitter almonds, adding sufficient rose water to moisten them. When they are all pounded to a paste, Mix them with a quarter of a pound of powdered loaf sugar 
and boil them in a quart of milk or cream then set it away to cool when cold stir eight beaten eggs into it put the mixture into cups set them in an iron oven half filled with water and bake them vanilla custards cut a vanilla bean into slips and boil them in a quart of milk with a quarter of a pound of white sugar let it boil slowly for a quarter of an hour and then set it away to cool when cold stir into it eight beaten eggs having left out the whites of four put the mixture into cups set them in water and bake them color them when done by holding over them a red hot shovel when cold grate on sugar lemon custards are made in the same manner substituting for the vanilla bean the grated rind of a large fresh lemon chocolate custards cut into pieces half a pound of the best chocolate pour on it sufficient milk to prevent its burning and let it boil ten minutes after you remove it from the fire have ready a pint of boiling milk or cream and pour it on to the chocolate beat together the yolks of eight eggs and the whites of two only and stir them into the chocolate with two ounces or more of loaf sugar put the mixture into cups set them in an oven with water in it and bake them beat the six remaining whites of eggs to a froth adding a very little sugar and heap some of the froth on each custard you may lay on the top of each heap of froth one of the bonbons or confections called chocolate nuts coffee custards take two ounces of roasted coffee and two ounces of raw coffee pound them together in a mortar but do not grind them boil this coffee in a quart of rich milk let it get cold and then strain it stir into it two ounces of powdered loaf sugar and two large spoonfuls of cream beat eight eggs omitting the whites of four stir them gradually into the coffee put it into cups and bake the custards in an oven with water grate white sugar over the tops when cold tea custards boil a quart of cream or rich milk and pour it while boiling on three ounces of the best green tea add two ounces of loaf sugar cover it and set it away take eight eggs and beat them well leaving out the whites of four and when the tea is cold stir in the eggs then strain the whole mixture pour it into cups and bake them in an oven with water grate sugar over the top of each rice pottage put six tablespoonfuls of rice into a pint of water and boil it till quite soft drain it through a sieve and put the rice into a quart of milk with a quarter of a pound of sugar and three or four peach leaves or a few peach kernels boil it and before you serve it up take out the peach leaves or kernels and stir in the yolks of two eggs apple fritters pare and core some fine large pippins and cut them into round slices soak them in brandy for two or three hours make a batter in the proportion of four eggs to a tablespoonful of olive oil a tablespoonful of rose water the same quantity of brandy the same quantity of cold water thicken the batter with a sufficient quantity of flour stirred in by degrees and mix it two or three hours before it is wanted that it may be light by fermentation put some butter into a frying pan dip each slice of apple into the batter and fry them brown then drain them grate white sugar over them and send them to table peach fritters may be made in the same way but the peaches must be cut into quarters bread fritters boil a quart of milk with cinnamon and sugar to your taste when done stir in a tablespoonful of rose water cut some slices of bread into a circular shape soak them in the milk till they have absorbed it then drain them have ready some yolks of eggs well beaten dip the slices of bread into it and fry them in butter serve them up strewed with powdered sugar rice cake take half a pound of rice and wash it well put it into a pint of cream or milk and boil it soft let it get cold then stir into it alternately a quarter of a pound of sugar two ounces of butter eight eggs well beaten having left out the whites of four and a wine glass of rose water or else the grated peel of a lemon mix all well butter a mold or a deep pan with straight sides and spread grated bread crumbs all over its inside put in the mixture and bake it three quarters of an hour ground rice is best for this cake if any of the cake is left you may next day cut it in slices and fry them in butter or instead of baking the mixture in a large cake 
you may put flour on your hands and roll it into round balls make a batter of beaten eggs sugar and grated bread dip the balls into it and fry them in butter potato cake roast in the ashes a dozen small or six large potatoes when done peel them and put them into a pan with a little salt and the rind of a lemon grated add a quarter of a pound of butter or half a pint of cream and a quarter of a pound of sugar having mashed the potatoes with this mixture rub it through a colander and stir it very hard then set it away to cool beat eight eggs and stir them gradually into the mixture season it with a teaspoonful of mixed spice and half a glass of rose water butter a mold or a deep dish and spread the inside all over with grated bread put in the mixture and bake it for three quarters of an hour sponge cake called in france biscuit take ten eggs and beat them till very thick and smooth add gradually a pound of powdered loaf sugar rub a lump of loaf sugar all over the rind of a large lemon to draw the juice to the surface then grate the peel of the lemon and stir it into the mixture together with a lump of sugar squeeze in the juice of the lemon and add two tablespoonfuls of rose water beat the mixture very hard then take half a pound of potato flour which is best or else a fine wheat flour and stir it in very lightly and slowly it must be baked immediately have ready some small square or oblong cases of thick white paper with an edge turned up all around and sewed at the corners they should be about a finger in length half a finger in breadth and an inch and a half in depth either butter these paper cases or sift white sugar all over the inside put some of the mixture into each case but do not fill them to the top great loaf sugar over the top of each and bake them quickly these cakes are much better when baked in paper cases tins being generally too thick for them no cake requires greater care in baking if the oven is not hot enough both at top and bottom they will fall and be heavy and lose their shape croquettes take a pound of powdered sugar a pound of butter half a pound of wheat flour and half a pound of indian meal mix all together and add the juice and grated peel of a large lemon with spice to your taste make it into a lump of paste then put it into a mortar and beat it hard on all sides roll it out thin and cut it into cakes with the edge of a tumbler or with a tin cutter flour a shallow tin pan lay the cakes into it but not close together bake them about ten minutes grate sugar over them when done marguerites beat together till very light a pound of butter and a pound of powdered sugar sift a pound of flour into a pan take the yolks only of twelve eggs and beat them till very thick and smooth pour them into the flour and add the beaten butter and sugar stir in a grated nutmeg and a wine glass of rose water mix the whole together till it becomes a lump of dough flour your pasteboard and lay the dough upon it sprinkle it with flour roll it out about half an inch thick and cut it into round cakes with the edge of a cup flour a shallow pan put in the cakes so as not to touch and bake them about five minutes in a quick oven if the oven is too cool they will run when the cakes are cool lay on each a large lump of currant jelly take the whites of the eggs and beat them till they stand alone then add to them by degrees sufficient powdered sugar to make the consistence of icing and ten drops of strong essence of lemon heap on each cake with a spoon a pile of the icing over the currant jelly set them in a cool oven till the icing becomes firm and of a pale brownish tint these cakes are very fine wafers stir half a pound of flour into a pan make a hole in the middle and put in three beaten eggs a tablespoonful of brandy a tablespoonful of powdered sugar a tablespoonful of sweet oil and a very little salt not more then will lie on a sixpence mix all together adding gradually a little milk till you have a batter about the thickness of good cream then stir in a tablespoonful of rose water let there be no lumps in the batter heat your wafer iron on both sides in a clear fire but do not allow it to get red hot then grease the inside with a brush dipped in sweet oil or a clean rag with some butter tied up in it then put in the batter allowing about two tablespoonfuls to each wafer close the iron and in baking turn it first on one side and then on the other when done sprinkle the wafers with powdered sugar 
and roll each one up, pressing the edges together while warm so as to make them unite. A little practice will soon show you the proper degree of heat and the time necessary for baking the wafers. They should be but slightly colored and of an even tint all over. Gingerbread. Mix together two pounds of flour, one pound of sugar, five beaten eggs, three quarters of a pound of butter, and a teacupful of ginger. Put the flour to the other ingredients a little at a time and stir the whole very hard. Melt a teaspoonful of sal aratus or fine pearl ash in a little sour milk and stir it in at the last. Roll the dough into sheets and cut it out with square tins. If not stiff enough for rolling, add a little more flour. Lay it in buttered pans and bake it in a moderate oven. End of Domestic French Cookery by Sulpice Barouet Read by Betty B. Flirting by Elizabeth Lynn Linton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There are certain things which can never be accurately described, things so shadowy, so fitful, so dependent on the mood of the moment, both in the audience and the actor, that analysis and representation are equally at fault, and flirting is one of them. What is flirting? Who can define or determine? It is more serious than talking nonsense and not so serious as making love. It is not chaff and it is not feeling. It means something more than indifference, and yet something less than affection. It binds no one, it commits no one, though it raises expectations in the individual and sets society on the lookout for results. It is a plaything in the hands of the experienced, but a deadly weapon against the breasts of the unwary, and it is a thing so vague, so protean, that the most accurate measure of moral values would be puzzled to say where it exactly ends and where serious intentions begin. But again we ask, what is flirting? What constitutes its essence? What makes the difference between it and chaff on the one hand and it and love-making on the other? Has it a cumulative power, and, according to the old saying of many a pickle making a mickle, does a long series of small flirtings make up a concrete whole of love? Or is it like an unmortared heap of bricks, potential utilities if conditions were changed, but valueless as things are? The man who would be able to reduce flirting to a definite science, who could analyze its elements and codify its laws, would be doing infinite service to his generation, but we fear that this is about as difficult as finding the pot of gold under the end of a rainbow or catching small birds with a pinch of salt. Everyone has his or her ideas of what constitutes flirting. Consequently, everyone judges of that pleasant exercise according to individual temperament and experience. Faded flowers, who see impropriety in everything they are no longer able to enjoy, Say with more or less severity that Henry and Angelina are flirting, if they are laughing while whispering together in a Malkov, probably the most innocent nonsense in the world. But the fact that they are enjoying themselves in their own way, albeit a silly one, is enough for the faded flower to think they are after mischief, flirting being to her mind about the worst bit of mischief that a fallen humanity can perpetrate. The watchful mother, intent on chances, says that dancing together oftener than is necessary for good breeding and just the amount of attention demanded by circumstances is flirting. Timid girls, newly out, and not yet used to the odd ways of men, think they are being flirted with outrageously if their partner fires off the meekest little compliment at them, or looks at them more tenderly than he would look at a cabbage. But bolder spirits of both sexes think nothing worthy of the name which does not include a few questionable familiarities and an equivoque or two more or less risky. With some, flirting is nothing but the passing fun of the moment. With others, it is the first lesson of the great unopened book and means the beginning of the end. With some, it is not even angling with intent. 
With others, it is deep-sea fishing with a broad, boldly made net, and taking all fish that come in as good for sport if not for food. Flirts are of many kinds as well as of all degrees. There are quiet flirts and demonstrative flirts, flirts of the subtle sort whose practice is made by the eyes alone, by the manner, by the tender little sigh, by the bend of the head and the wave of the hand, to give pathos and point to the otherwise harmless word, and flirts of the organ and rampant kind, who go up quite boldly towards the point, but who never reach it, taking care to draw back in time before they fairly cross the border. This is the kind which, as the flirt male, does incalculable damage to the poor little fluttering dove to whom it is as a bird of prey, handsome, bold, cruel. But this is the kind which has unlimited success, using as it does that immense moral leverage we call tantalizing, forever rousing hopes and exciting expectations, and luring a woman on as an inis fabus lures us on across the marsh in the vain belief that it will bring us to our heaven at last. Akin to this kind are those may flirts who are great in the way in which they manage to insinuate things without committing themselves to positive statements. They generally contrive to give the impression of some mysterious hindrance by which they are held back from full and frank confession. They hint at fatal bonds, at unfortunate attachments, at a past that has burnt them up or withered them up at any rate, that has prevented their future from blossoming in the direction in which they would fain have had it blossom and bear fruit. They sketch out vaguely the outlines of some thrilling romance. A few, of the Byronic breed, add the suspicion of some dark and melancholy crime as a further romantic charm and personal obstacle, and when they have got the girl's pity, and the love that is akin to pity, then they cool down scientifically, never creating any scandal, never making any rupture, never coming to a moment when awkward explanations can be asked, but cooling nevertheless, till the thing drops of its own accord and dies out from inanition, when they are free to carry their sorrows and their mysteries elsewhere. Some men spend their lives in this kind of thing, and find their pleasure in making all the women they know madly or sentimentally in love with them, and if by chance any poor moth who has burnt her wings makes too loud an outcry, the tables are turned against her dexterously, and she is held up to public pity, contempt would be a better word, as one who has suffered herself to love too well and by no means wisely, and who has run after a Lothario by no means inclined to let himself be caught. Then there are certain men who flirt only with married women, and others who flirt only with girls, and the two pastimes are as different as tropical sunlight and northern moonshine. And there are some who are brothers, and some who are fathers to their young friends, suspicious fathers on the whole, not unlike little red riding hood's grandmother the wolf, with perilously bright eyes, and not a little danger to red riding hood in the relationship, how delightful soever it may be to the wolf. Some are content with cousinship only, which, however, breaks down quite sufficient fences, and some are dearest friends no more, and find that an exceedingly useful centre from which to work onward and outward. For if any peg will do on which to hang a discourse, so will any relationship or adoption serve the ends of flirting, if it be so willed. But what is flirting? Is sitting away in corners, talking in low voices and looking personally affronted if any unlucky outsider comes within earshot flirting? Not necessarily. It is just possible that Henry may be telling Angelina all about his admiration for her sister Grace, or Angelina may be confessing to Henry what Charlie said to her last night, which makes her lower her eyes as she is doing now and play with the fringe of her fan so nervously. Maybe, if not likely. So that sitting away in corners and whispering together is not necessarily flirting, though it may look like it. It's dancing all the round dances together. This goes for decided flirting in the code of the ballroom. But if the two keep well together, if they are really fond of dancing, as one of the fine arts combining science and enjoyment, they would dance with each other all night, 
though outside the marble halls, they might be deadly enemies. Montagues and Capulets, with no echo of Romeo and Juliet to soften their mutual dislike. So that not even dancing together oftener than is absolutely necessary is unmistakable evidence, any more than is sitting away in corners, seeing that equal skill and keeping well in step are reasons enough for perpetual partnership, making all idea of flirtation unnecessary. In fact, there is no outward sign nor symbol of flirting which may not be mistaken and turned round, because flirting is so entirely in the intention and not in the mere formula that it becomes a kind of phantasm, a proteus, impossible to seize or to depict with accuracy. One thing, however, we can say. Taking gifts and attentions, offered with evident design, and accepted with tacit understanding, may be certainly held as constituting an important element of flirting. But this is flirting on the woman's side, and here you are being continually taken in. Your flirt of the cunningly simple kind, who smiles so sweetly and seems so flatteringly glad to see you when you come, who takes all your presents and acted expressions of love with the most bewitching gratitude and effusion, even she, so simple as she seems to be, slips the thread and will not be caught if she does not wish to be caught. At the decisive moment, when you think you have secured her, she makes a bound and is away, then turns round, looks you in the face, and with many a tear and pretty asseveration declares that she never understood you to mean what you say you have meant all along, and that you are cruel to dispel her dream of a pleasant and harmless friendship and very wicked indeed, because you press her for a decision. Yes, you are cruel, because you have believed her honest, cruel because you did not see through the veil of flattery and insincerity in which she clothed her selfishness, cruel because she was false. This is the flirt's logic when brought to book, and forced to confess that her pretended love was only flirting, and that she led you on to your destruction, simply because it pleased her vanity to make you her victim. Then there are flirts of the open and rollicking kind, who let you go far, very far indeed, when suddenly they pull up and assume an offended air as if you had willfully transgressed known and absolute boundaries. Girls and women, who lead you on all in the way of good fellowship, to knock you over when you have got just far enough to lose your balance. That is their form of the art. They like to see how far they can make a man forget himself, and how much stronger their own delusive enticements are than prudence, experience and common sense. And there are flirts of the artful and still waters kind, something like the male flirts spoken of just now, sentimental little pussies. Perhaps pretty young wives with uncomfortable husbands, whose griefs have by no means soured nor scorched, but just mellowed and refined them. Or they may be of the sisterly class, creatures so very frank, so very sisterly and confiding and as suspicious of evil, that really you scarcely know how to deal with them at all. And there are flares of the scientific kind, women who have studied the art thoroughly, and who are adepts in the use of every weapon known, using each according to circumstances and the nature of the victim, and using each with deadly precision. From such may a kind providence deliver us, as the tender mercies of the wicked, so are the scientific lairds, the women and the men who play at balls with human hearts, for the stakes of a whole life's happiness on the one side, and a few weeks of gratified vanity on the other. It used to be an old schoolboy maxim that no real gentleman could be refused by a lady, because no real gentleman could presume beyond his line of encouragement. A fortiori, no lady would or could give more encouragement than she meant. What are we to say then of our flirts if this maxim be true? Are they really no gentlemen and no ladies, according to the famous formula of the kitchen? Perhaps it would be said so if gentlehood meant now, as it meant centuries ago, the real worth and virtue of humanity, for flirting with intent is a cruel, false, heartless amusement. And time was when cruelty and falsehood were essentially sins which vitiated all claims to gentlehood. 
And yet, the world would be very dull without that innocent kind of nonsense which often goes by the name of flirting. That pleasant something, which is more than mere acquaintanceship, and less than formal loverhood. That bright and animated intercourse, which makes the hours pass so easily, yet which leaves no bitter pang of self-reproach. That indefinite and undefinable interest by which the one man or the one woman becomes a kind of microcosm for the time, the epitome of all that is pleasant and of all that is lovely. The only caution to be observed is, do not go too far. End of Flirting by Elizabeth Lynn Linton, read by Claudia Caldi. Food in Little Italy by Julia Davis Chandler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. If foreign travel be impossible and books about other lands only tantalizing, you may find quite a little diversion and gain some information by visiting the foreign quarters in our large American cities for there many people live in much the same way that they did in their homes across the seas. Without undue tax upon your vocabulary or purse, you can go to the Italian shops. Some of the stores you will find orderly and clean, where you will be waited upon by swarthy men. Or you may encounter a dashing brunette whose eyes look as if they could flash all too gaily in the excitement of the tarantella, and who glances boldly at you, not desirous of answering your inquiries, and shrieking in a vixenish manner at some mild youth peacefully reading a paper when he essays to call boss for the owner of the shop to come and interpret for you. Do not feel dismayed by this experience, for at the next place you may find a young mother tending shop with her baby in her arms, looking markedly like the gentle, oval-faced Madonnas of Raphael. Besides the little shops, there are large Italian importing grocers, where men who understand foreign edibles and like good living are wont to go for fine cheese and wines at a moderate price. There will be wine known as Chianti and sweet red Lacrima Christi, which suggests port, but is not so astringent. As one girl said, I did not know what Lacrima Christi was until I went into an Italian shop. When Cousin Millicent mentioned it in a letter from Italy, I supposed from the name it must be a sorrowful carving in a church or wayside shrine. On the walls and ceilings of the Italian groceries are hung many hams, cheeses, the latter shaped like a gourd and dark colored from the manner of curing. Slice across one and the fine firm texture, pleasant flavor and yellow color will be revealed. Some are made of sheep and goat's milk. There will be Cassiavalli, Provoli, Pecorino, Toscano and Roman, besides the more familiar Gorgonzola and Parmesan. Of course, there are sausages and quantities of sardines, anchovies, tunny fish, pickled eels, dark ripe olives and green ones, red peppers, and dried fruits. Under the name of pomidoro, one may recognize our familiar tomato. It comes as a thick paste, either in cans or in large receptacles, from which it is sold by the pound for making soups and sauces and for macaroni dressing. Without a great array of macaroni pastes, it would not be an Italian shop. Artichokes in cans are for sale and are very cheap. The globe or French artichoke, not the tubers. Oranges and chestnuts are sold by the curbstone vendors. At the confectionery stores, you will find almond candies predominating in all colors, both soft and brilliant, for it is the hard sugar-coated almonds that are preferred. Hazelnut nougat is 40 cents a pound, very solid with nuts, unblanched, which is a pity, and here and there bits of citron with the nuts. At little bake shops are very nice almond biscotines, and apple patties, two for five cents, have delicate pastry prettily edged and a well-prepared filling. The kindly patrons stand back and let you buy first, for they see that you are not one of them, and kindly explain what the various things are composed of. The attendant cannot do so. Not only at a restaurant conspicuously labeled Cosmopolitan, do you see an American pie, but almost everywhere you go, even the crumb pie of the Pennsylvania Germans, if it is in Philadelphia that you choose to go a-hunting. Will you enter the Café Muscani 
and hear the music if you are told the owner is a relative of the noted musician of that name further on is the cafe posilipo will you venture in there for shellfish as if you were on the bay of naples or at a more showy corner place with a large display window where you can see ristorante di roma will you try some of the mushrooms and raviolis or will you go further to the restaurant della bella napoli in the window are fresh liver fresh eggplant some pies a basket of mushrooms cream cakes croquettes ready for frying and a platter of raviolis ready for their final cooking raviolis are a form of dumpling a boiled noodle dough is stretched very thin and on it at regular intervals is placed high seasoned chopped meat or vegetables when half has been so filled the other half of the pastry is carefully lifted and placed over the top the separate little flattened mounds of filling are then cut out with a sharp cutter often with scalloped edges and the edges of pastry are then pressed together with a little milk or water to aid in uniting them then they are ready for the final cooking but are usually set away a while when the meal is to be served they are lifted with care as the thin dough breaks easily and are poached in broth or salted water lift them with a salted skimmer when done draining off all water or broth in a frying pan containing plenty of hot butter fry some bread dice until crispy brown pour the brown butter and bread dice over the raviolis and serve at once bread crumbs are mixed with the meat filling and bound together with yolk of egg sometimes again giblets are used and the raviolis are served around boiled fowl cauliflower is a suitable vegetable with a little cheese sauce for raviolis garibaldi once observed that the thought of raviolis sometimes tempted him to give up camp life and warfare for peace and home life if you do not know where to purchase a few pennies will make many a child anxious to be your guide from shop to shop as they attend school they make ready interpreters examine the italian shapes of bread so made as to secure the largest amount of crust by ingenious slashings there is star bread stella de pane and ring-shaped twists and square sheets of pepper bread this pepper bread is wet with olive oil and dredged with black pepper to create thirst just as the germans use a salted pretzel as an appetizer italian breads are made of good hard wheat flour a laborer will make a meal from a loaf split and spread with sliced onions a strange example here is given of an immense loaf shaped like a man with a cheese in one hand and a basket of fruit in another and all the articles of dress and ornament modeled with care so much more difficult to do in bread that rises than in cookies or crackers for all souls day in brescia italy it is said by mrs buckland that breads are made in the form of bones of the leg or arm and jaw bones set with almonds for teeth such symbolic breads are grotesque italy's greatest poet dante has said that other people's bread was bitter and other people's stairs hard to climb and another poet who loved italy well has said what if the bread be bitter in thine inn and thou unshod to meet the flints at least it may be said because the way is short i thank thee god probably some little inn and poor bread there and the mountain reaches above it seem typical to mrs browning of our life journey italy is not noted as a land of good bread yeast is sent from paris unless sour leaven be used in the cities various breads to suit the tastes of tourists can be had in the northern parts of italy chestnuts are used for bread while in the south maize grows well and is used both for bread and polenta one of the very old tombs in italy shows a baker's utensils carved upon the entrance the ancient romans showed great taste and indulged in great luxury when rome could levy upon many lands for her feasts modern italian cookery has become better known to english readers since the publication of two little volumes by different writers within a few years when we think of ice cream our minds are set at rest by the thought of not having to choose varieties for one has but to order that pretty italian cream known as neapolitan brick to have a pleasant blending of variously flavored layers it is said that the popular ice cream sandwich originated with an itinerant italian ice cream vendor now in daintier guise at nice cafes and quick lunch places ice cream sandwiches are a favorite order as the pleasing finish of a shopping luncheon in little italy should you be subject to apprehension 
about the cleanliness of the neighborhood, you can decide to buy only original packaged goods, such as wine, cheese, canned vegetables, truffles, and olive oil, ere you wend your way home to entertain your family with an account of your jaunt into the foreign quarter. End of Food in Little Italy by Julia Davis Chandler Read by Betty B. Giordano Bruno by Walter Pater. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in July 2022. Giordano Bruno died Paris 1586 by Walter Horatio Pater. Jetzo, da ich ausgewachsen, viel gelesen, viel gereist, schwillt mein Herz und ganz von Herzen, glaub ich, an den Heiligen Geist. Heine It was on the afternoon of the Feast of Pentecost that news of the death of Charles the Ninth went abroad promptly. To his successor, the day became a sweet one, to be noted unmistakably by various pious and other observances, and it was on a wit Sunday afternoon that curious Parisians had the opportunity of listening to one who, as if with some intentional new version of the sacred event then commemorated, had a great deal to say concerning the spirit, above all of the freedom, the independence of its operation. The speaker, though understood to be a brother of the order of St. Dominic, had not been present at the Mass, the usual university mass, the Spiritu Sancto, said today according to the natural course of the season in the chapel of the Sorbonne by the Italian bishop of Paris. It was the reign of the Italians just then, a doubly refined, somewhat morbid, somewhat ash-coloured Italy in France, more Italian still. Men of Italian birth, to the great suspicion of simple people, swarmed in Paris, already flightier, less constant than the girouettes on its steeples, and it was love for Italian fashions that had brought king and courtiers here today, with great eclat, as they said, frizzed and starched, in the beautiful, minutely considered dress of the moment, pressing the university into a perhaps not unmerited background, for the promised speaker, about whom tongues had been busy, not only in the Latin quarter, had come from Italy. In an age in which all things about which Parisians much cared must be Italian, there might be a hearing for Italian philosophy. Courtiers at least would understand Italian, and this speaker was rumoured to possess in perfection all the curious arts of his native language. And of all the kingly qualities of Henry's youth, the single one that had held by him was that gift of eloquence which he was able also to value in others, inherited, perhaps, for in all the contemporary and subsequent historic gossip about his mother, the two things certain are, that the hands credited with so much mysterious ill-doing were fine ones, and that she was an admirable speaker. Bruno himself tells us, long after he had withdrawn himself from it, that the monastic life promotes the freedom of the intellect by its silence and self-concentration. The prospect of such freedom sufficiently explains why a young man who, however well found in worldly and personal advantages, was conscious above all of great intellectual possessions, and of fastidious spirit also, with a remarkable distaste for the vulgar, should have espoused poverty, chastity, obedience in a Dominican cloister. What liberty of mind may really come to in such places, what daring new departures it may suggest to the strictly monastic temper, is exemplified by the dubious and dangerous mysticism of men like John of Parma and Joachim of Flora, reputed author of the new everlasting gospel, strange dreamers in a world of sanctified rhetoric, of that later dispensation of the spirit in which all law must have passed away, or again by a recognized tendency in the great rival order of St. Francis, in the so-called spiritual Franciscans, to understand the dogmatic words of faith with a difference. 
the three convents in which bruno lived successively at naples at Città di campagna and finally the minerva at rome developed freely we may suppose all the mystic qualities of a genius in which from the first a heady southern imagination took the lead but it was from beyond conventional bounds he would look for the sustenance the fuel of an ardor born or bred within them amid such artificial religious stillness the air itself becomes generous in undertones the vain young monk vain of course would feed his vanity by puzzling the good sleepy heads of the average sons of dominic with his neology putting new wine into old bottles teaching them their own business the new higher truer sense of the most familiar terms the chapters they read the hymns they sang above all as it happened every word that referred to the spirit the reign of the spirit its excellent freedom he would soon pass beyond the utmost limits of his brethren's sympathy beyond the largest and freest interpretation those words would bear to thoughts and words of an altogether different plane of which the full scope was only to be felt in certain old pagan writers though approached perhaps at first as having a kind of natural preparatory kinship with scripture itself the dominicans would seem to have had well stocked liberally selected libraries and this curious youth in that age of restored letters read eagerly easily and very soon came to the kernel of a difficult old author plotinus or plato to the purpose of thinkers older still surviving by glimpses only in the books of others empedocles pythagoras who had enjoyed the original divine sense of things above all parmenides that most ancient asserter of god's identity with the world the affinities the unity of the visible and the invisible of earth and heaven of all things whatever with each other through the consciousness the person of god the spirit who was at every moment of infinite time in every atom of matter at every point of infinite space i was everything in turn that doctrine l'antica philosophia italiana was in all its vigour there a hardy growth out of the very heart of nature interpreting itself to congenial minds with all the fullness of primitive utterance a big thought yet suggesting perhaps from the first in still small immediately practical voice some possible modification of a freer way of taking certain moral precepts say a primitive morality congruous with those larger primitive ideas the larger survey the earlier more liberal air returning to this ancient pantheism after so long a reign of a seemingly opposite faith bruno unfalteringly asserts the vision of all things in god to be the aim of all metaphysical speculation as of all inquiry into nature the spirit of god in countless variety of forms neither above nor in any way without but intimately within all things really present with equal integrity in the sunbeam ninety millions of miles long and the wandering drop of water as it evaporates therein the divine consciousness would have the same relation to the production of things as the human intelligence to the production of true thoughts concerning them nay those thoughts are themselves god in man alone there too of his assisting spirit who in truth creates all things in and by his own contemplation of them for him as for man in proportion as man thinks truly thought and being are identical and things exist only in so far as they are known delighting in itself in the sense of its own energy this sleepness capacious fiery intelligence evokes all the orders of nature all the revolutions of history cycle upon cycle in ever new types and god the spirit the soul of the world being really identical with his own soul bruno as the universe shapes itself to his reason his imagination ever more and more articulately shares also the divine joy in that process of the formation of true ideas 
which is really parallel to the process of creation, to the evolution of things. In a certain mystic sense, which some in every age of the world have understood, he too is creator, himself actually a participator in the creative function. And by such a philosophy, he assures us, it was his experience that the soul is greatly expanded. Conquesta filosofia l'anima mis sagrandisse, mi se magnifica l'intelletto. For, with characteristic largeness of mind, Bruno accepted this theory in the whole range of its consequences. Its more immediate corollary was the famous axiom of indifference, of the coincidence of contraries. To the eye of God, to the philosophic vision through which God sees in man, nothing is really alien from him. The differences of things, and, above all, those distinctions which schoolmen and priests, old or new, Roman or reformed, had invented for themselves, would be lost in the length and breadth of the philosophic survey, nothing in itself, either great or small, and matter, certainly, in all its various forms, not evil, but divine. Could one choose or reject this or that? If God the Spirit had made, nay, was, all things indifferently, then matter and spirit, the spirit and the flesh, heaven and earth, freedom and necessity, the first and the last, good and evil, would be superficial rather than substantial differences. Only, were joy and sorrow also to be added to the list of phenomena really coincident or indifferent, as some intellectual kinsmen of Bruno have claimed they should. The Dominican brother was at no distant day to break far enough away from the election, the seeming vocation of his youth, yet would remain always, and under all circumstances, unmistakably a monk in some predominant qualities of temper. At first, it only by way of thought that he asserted his liberty, delightful, late-found privilege, traversing in mental journeys that spacious circuit as it broke away before him at every moment into ever new horizons. Kindling thought and imagination at once, the prospect draws from him cries of joy, a kind of religious joy, as in some new canticle of the creatures, a new monkish hymnal or antiphonary nature becomes for him a sacred term. Conform thyself to nature. With what sincerity, what enthusiasm, what religious fervor he enounces the precept to others, to himself. Recovering, as he fancies, a certain primeval sense of deity broadcast on things, in which Pythagoras and other inspired theorists of early Greece had abounded, in his hands philosophy becomes a poem, a sacred poem, as it had been with them. That Bruno himself, in the enthusiasm of the idea, drew from his axiom of the indifference of contraries, the practical consequence which is in very deed latent there, that he was ready to sacrifice to the antinomianism, which is certainly a part of its rigid logic, the purities of his youth, for instance, there is no proof. The service, the sacrifice, he is ready to bring to the great light that has dawned for him, which occupies his entire conscience with the sense of his responsibilities to it, is that of days and nights spent in eager study, of a plenary, disinterested utterance of the thoughts that arise in him, at any hazard, at the price, say, of martyrdom. The work of the Divine Spirit, as he conceives it, exalts, inebriates him, till the scientific apprehension seems to take the place of prayer, sacrifice, communion. It would be a mistake, he holds, to attribute to the human soul capacities merely passive or receptive. She, too, possesses not less than the soul of the world, initiatory power, responding with the free gift of a light and heat that seem her own. Yet a nature so opulently endowed can hardly have been lacking in purely physical ardours. His pantheistic belief that the Spirit of God was in all things was not inconsistent with, might encourage, a keen and restless eye for the dramatic details of life and character for humanity in all its visible attractiveness, 
since there too in truth divinity lurks from those first fair days of early greek speculation love had occupied a large place in the conception of philosophy and in after days bruno was fond of developing like plato like the christian platonist combining something of the peculiar temper of each the analogy between intellectual enthusiasm and the flights of physical love with an animation which shows clearly enough the reality of his experience in the latter the eroici furori his book of books dedicated to philip sidney who would be no stranger to such thoughts presents a singular blending of verse and prose after the manner of dante's vita nuova the supervening philosophic comment reconsiders those earlier physical impulses which had prompted the sonnet in voluble italian entirely to the advantage of their abstract incorporeal equivalents yet if it is after all but a prose comment it betrays no lack of the natural stuff out of which such mystic transferences must be made that there is no single name or preference no beatrice or laura by no means proves the young man's earlier desires merely platonic and if the colours of love inevitably lose a little of their force and propriety by such deflection the intellectual purpose as certainly finds its opportunity thereby in the manner of borrowed fire and wings a kind of old scholastic pedantry creeping back over the ardent youth who had thrown it off so defiantly as if love itself went in for a degree at the university bruno develops under the mask of amorous verse all the various stages of abstraction by which as the last step of a long ladder the mind attains actual union for as with the purely religious mystics union the mystic union of souls with each other and their lord nothing less than union between the contemplator and the contemplated the reality or the sense or at least the name of it was always at hand whence that instinctive tendency if not from the creator of things himself who has doubtless prompted it in the physical universe as in man how familiar the thought that the whole creation longs for god the soul as the heart for the water brooks to unite oneself to the infinite by breadth and lucidity of intellect to enter by that admirable faculty into eternal life this was the true vocation of the spouse of the rightly amorous soul a philosophia e necessario amore there would be degrees of progress therein as of course also of relapse joys and sorrows therefore and in surprising these the philosopher whose intellectual ardours have superseded religion and love is still a lover and a monk all the influences of the convent the heady sweet incense the pleading sounds the sophisticated light and air the exaggerated humour of gothic carvers the thick stratum of pagan sentiment beneath santa maria sopra minerva are indelible in him tears sympathies tender inspirations attraction repulsion dryness zeal desire recollection he finds a place for them all knows them all well in their unaffected simplicity while he seeks the secret and secondary or as he fancies the primary form and purport of each a light on actual life or mere barren scholastic subtlety never before had the pantheistic doctrine be developed with such completeness never before connected with so large a sense of nature so large a promise of the knowledge of it as it really is the eyes that had not been wanting to visible humanity turned with equal liveliness on the natural world in that region of his birth where all its force and colour is twofold nature is not only a thought in the divine mind it is also the perpetual energy of that mind which ever identical with itself puts forth and absorbs in turn all the successive forms of life of thought of language even but what seemed like striking transformation of matter were in truth only a chapter a clause in the great volume of the transformations of the spirit 
to that mystic recognition that all is divine had succeeded a realization of the largeness of the field of concrete knowledge the infinite extent of all there was actually to know winged fortified by this central philosophic faith the student proceeds to the reading of nature led on from point to point by manifold lights which will surely strike on him by the way from the intelligence in it speaking directly sympathetically to the intelligence in him the earth's wonderful animation as divined by one who anticipates by a whole generation the philosophy of experience in that the bold flighty pantheistic speculation became tangible matter of fact here was the needful book for man to read the full revelation the detailed story of that one universal mind struggling emerging through shadow substance manifest spirit in various orders of being the veritable history of god and nature together with the true pedigree and evolution of man also his gradual issue from it was still all to learn the delightful tangle of things it would be the delightful task of man's thoughts to disentangle that already bruno had measured the space which bacon would fill with room perhaps for darwin also that deity is everywhere like all such abstract propositions is a two-edged force depending for its practical effect on the mind which admits it on the peculiar perspective of that mind to dutch spinoza in the next century faint consumptive with a hold on external things naturally faint the theorem that god was in all things whatever annihilating their differences suggested a somewhat chilly withdrawal from the contact of all alike in bruno eager and impassioned an italian of the italians it awoke a constant inextinguishable appetite for every form of experience a fear as of the one sin possible of limiting for oneself or another that great stream flowing for thirsty souls that wide pasture set ready for the hungry heart considered from the point of view of a minute observation of nature the infinite might figure as the infinitely little no blade of grass being like another as there was no limit to the complexities of an atom of earth cell sphere within sphere but the earth itself hitherto seemingly the privileged centre of a very limited universe was after all itself but an atom in an infinite world of starry space then lately displayed to the ingenious intelligence which the telescope was one day to verify to bodily eyes for if bruno must needs look forward to the future to bacon for adequate knowledge of the earth the infinitely little he looked back gratefully to another daring mind which had already put the earth into its modest place and opened the full view of the heavens if god is eternal then the universe is infinite and worlds innumerable yes one might well have supposed what reason now demonstrated indicating those endless spaces which sidereal science would gradually occupy an echo of the creative word of god himself qui in numero numero in numerorum nomina dicit that the stars are suns that the earth is in motion that the earth is of like stuff with the stars now the familiar knowledge of children dawning on bruno as calm assurance of reason on appeal from the prejudice of the eye brought to him an inexpressibly exhilarating sense of enlargement of the intellectual nay the physical atmosphere and his consciousness of unfailing unity and order did not desert him in that larger survey making the utmost one could ever know of the earth seem but a very little chapter in that endless history of god the spirit rejoicing so greatly in the admirable spectacle that it never ceases to evolve from matter new conditions the immovable earth beneath one's feet one almost felt the movement the respiration of god in it and yet how greatly even the physical eye the sensible imagination so to term it was flattered by the theorem what joy in that motion the prospect the music the music of the spheres he could listen to it in a perfection such as had never been conceded to plato to pythagoras even veni creator spiritus 
mentes tuorum visita, imple superna gratia, quae tu creasti pectora. Yes, the grand old Christian hymns, perhaps the grandest of them, seemed to blend themselves in the chorus, to deepen immeasurably under this new intention. It is not always, or often, that men's abstract ideas penetrate the temperament, touch the animal spirits, affect conduct. It was what they did with Bruno. The ghastly spectacle of the endless material universe, infinite dust, in truth, starry as it may look to our terrestrial eyes, that prospect from which Pascal's faithful soul recoiled so painfully, induced in Bruno only the delightful consciousness of an ever-widening kinship and sympathy, since every one of those infinite worlds must have its sympathetic inhabitants. Scruples of conscience, if he felt such, might well be pushed aside for the excellency of such knowledge as this. To shut the eyes, whether of the body or the mind, would be a kind of dark ingratitude, the one sin, to believe directly or indirectly in any absolute dead matter anywhere, because involving denial of the indwelling spirit. A free spirit certainly as of old. Through all its pantheistic flights, from horizon to horizon, it was still the thought of liberty that presented itself to the infinite relish of this prodigal son of Dominic. God the Spirit had made all things indifferently, with a largeness, a beneficence, impiously belied by any theory of restrictions, distinctions, absolute limitations. Touch, see, listen, eat freely of all the trees of the garden of paradise, with the voice of the Lord God literally everywhere. Here was the final counsel of perfection. The world was even larger than youthful appetite, youthful capacity. Let theologian and every other theorist beware how he narrowed either. The plurality of worlds, how petty in comparison seemed the sins, to purge which was the chief motive for coming to places like this convent, whence Bruno, with vows broken, or obsolete for him, presently departed. A sonnet, expressive of the joy with which he returned to so much more than the liberty of ordinary men, does not suggest that he was driven from it. Though he must have seemed to those who surely had loved so lovable a creature there to be departing, like the prodigal of the gospel, into the furthest of possible far countries, there is no proof of harsh treatment, or even of an effort to detain him. It happens, of course, most naturally, that those who undergo the shock of spiritual or intellectual change sometimes fail to recognize their debt to the deserted cause. How much of the heroism or other high quality of their rejection has really been the growth of what they reject? Bruno, the escaped monk, is still a monk. His philosophy, impious as it might seem to some, a new religion. He came forth well fitted by conventual influences to play upon men as he was played upon. A challenge, a war cry, an alarum, everywhere he seemed to be the creature of some subtly materialized spiritual force, like that of the old Greek prophets, like the primitive enthusiasm he was inclined to set so high, or impulsive Pentecostal fire. His hunger to know, fed at first dreamily enough within the convent walls as he wandered over space and time, an indefatigable reader of books, would be fed physically now by ear and eye, by large matter-of-fact experience, as he journeys from university to university. Yet still, less as a teacher than a courtier, a citizen of the world, a knight-errant of intellectual light. The philosophic need to try all things had given reasonable justification to the stirring desire for travel common to youth, in which, if in nothing else, that whole age of the later Renaissance was invincibly young. The theoretic recognition of that mobile spirit of the world, ever renewing its youth, became, sympathetically, the motive of a life as mobile, as ardent as itself, of a continual journey, the venture and stimulus of which would be the occasion of ever new discoveries, of renewed conviction. The unity, the spiritual unity of the world, that must involve the alliance, the congruity of all things with each other, 
great reinforcement of sympathy of the teacher's personality with the doctrine he had to deliver the spirit of that doctrine with the fashion of its utterance in his own case certainly as bruno confronted his audience at paris himself his theme his language were the fuel of one clear spiritual flame which soon had hold of his audience also alien strangely alien as it might seem from the speaker it was intimate discourse in magnetic touch with every one present with his special point of impressibility the sort of speech which consolidated into literary form as a book would be a dialogue according to the true attic genius full of those diversions passing irritations unlooked-for appeals in which a solicitous missionary finds his largest range of opportunity and takes even dull wits unaware in bruno that abstract theory of the perpetual motion of the world was a visible person talking with you and as the runaway dominican was still in temper a monk so he presented himself in the comely dominican habit the eyes which in their last sad protest against stupidity would mistake or miss altogether the image of the crucified were to-day for the most part kindly observant eyes registering every detail of that singular company all the physiognomic lights which come by the way on people and through them on things the shadows of ideas in men's faces the umbris idearum was the title of his discourse himself pleasantly animated by them in turn there was heroic gaiety there only as usual with gaiety the passage of a peevish cloud seemed all the chillier lit up in the agitation of speaking by many a harsh or a scornful beam yet always sinking in moments of repose to an expression of high-bred melancholy it was a face that looked after all made for suffering already half pleading half defiant as of a creature you could hurt but to the last never shake a hair's breadth from its estimate of yourself like nature like nature in that country of his birth the nolan as he delighted to proclaim himself laughed so well that born wanderer as he was he must perforce return thither sooner or later at the risk of life he gave plenis manibus but without selection and with all his contempt for the asinine vulgar was not fastidious his rank unweeded eloquence abounding in a play of words rabbinic allegories verses defiant of prosody in the kind of erudition he professed to despise with a shameless image here or there product not of formal method but of neapolitan improvisation was akin to the heady wine the sweet coarse odours of that fiery volcanic soil fertile in the irregularities which manifest power helping himself indifferently to all religions for rhetoric illustration his preference was still for that of the soil the old pagan one the primitive italian gods whose names and legends haunt his speech as they do the carved and pictorial work of the age according to the fashion of that ornamental paganism which the renaissance indulged to excite to surprise to move men's minds as the volcanic earth is moved as if in travail and according to the socratic fancy bringing them to the birth was the true function of the teacher however unusual it might seem in an ancient university fantastic from first to last that was the descriptive epithet and the very word carrying us to shakespeare reminds one how characteristic of the age such habit was and that it was pre-eminently due to italy a bookman yet with so vivid a hold on people and things the traits and tricks of the audience seemed to revive in him to strike from his memory all the graphic resources of his old readings he seemed to promise some greater matter than was then actually exposed himself to enjoy the fullness of a great outlook the vague suggestion of which did but sustain the curiosity of the listeners and still in hearing him speak you seemed to see that subtle spiritual fire to which he testified kindling from word to word what parisians then heard was in truth the first fervid expression of all those contending apprehensions out of which his written works would afterwards be compacted 
with much loss of heat in the process. Satiric or hybrid growths, things due to hybris and insolence, insult, all those fabled satyrs embodied, the volcanic south is kindly prolific of this, and Bruno abounded in mockeries, it was by way of protest. So much of a Platonist, for Plato's genial humour he had nevertheless substituted the harsh laughter of Aristophanes. Paris, teeming beneath a very courtly exterior, with mordant words and unabashed criticism of all real or suspected evil, provoked his utmost powers of scorn for the triumphant beast, the constellation of the ass, shining even there amid the university folk, those intellectual bankrupts of the Latin quarter, who had so long passed between them gravely a worthless parchment and paper currency. In truth, Aristotle, as the supplanter of Plato, was still in possession, pretending to determine heaven and earth by precedent, hiding the proper nature of things from the eyes of men. Habit, the last word of his practical philosophy, indolent habit. What would this mean in the intellectual life, but just that sort of dead judgments which are most opposed to the essential freedom and quickness of the spirit, because the mind, the eye, were no longer really at work in them. To Bruno, a true son of the Renaissance, in the light of those large, antique, pagan ideas, the difference between Rome and the Reform would figure, of course, as but an insignificant variation upon some deeper, more radical antagonism between two tendencies of men's minds. But what about an antagonism deeper still, between Christ and the world, say, Christ and the flesh, that so very ancient antagonism between good and evil? Was there any place for imperfection, in a world wherein the minutest atom, the lightest thought, could not escape from God's presence? Who should note the crime, the sin, the mistake, in the operation of that eternal spirit, which could have made no misshapen births? In proportion as a man raised himself to the ampler survey of the divine work around him, just in that proportion did the very notion of evil disappear. There were no weeds, no tears in the endless field. The truly illuminated mind, discerning spiritually, might do what it would. Even under the shadow of monastic walls that had ever been the precept which the larger theory of inspiration had bequeathed to practice. Of all the trees of the garden thou mayest freely eat. If you take up any deadly thing it shall not hurt you. And I think that I, too, have the spirit of God. Bruno, the citizen of the world, Bruno at Paris, was careful to warn off the vulgar from applying the decisions in philosophy beyond its proper speculative limits. But a kind of secrecy, an ambiguous atmosphere, encompassed from the first, alike the speaker and the doctrine, and in that world of fluctuating and ambiguous characters, the alerter mind certainly, pondering on this novel reign of the spirit, what it might actually be, would hardly fail to find in Bruno's theories a method of turning poison into food, to live and thrive thereon, an art surely no less opportune in the Paris of that hour, intellectually or morally, than had it related to physical poisons. If Bruno himself was cautious not to suggest the ethic or practical equivalent of his theoretic positions, there was that in his very manner of speech, in his rank, unweeded eloquence, which seemed naturally to discourage any effort at selection, any sense of fine difference, of nuances or proportion in things. The loose sympathies of his genius were allied to nature, nursing, with equable maternity of soul, good, bad, and indifferent, rather than to art, distinguishing, rejecting, refining. Commission and omission, sins of the former surely had the preference. And how would Paolo and Francesca have read the lesson? How would this Henry the Third and Margaret of the Memoirs and other susceptible persona then present read it, especially if the opposition between practical good and evil traversed another distinction to the opposite points, the fenced opposites, 
of which many, certainly then present, in that Paris of the last of the Valois, could never by any possibility become indifferent between the precious and the base, aesthetically, between what was right and wrong, as matter of art. End of Giordano Bruno by Walter Pater Grampian Hill's Battle From the History of the Wars in Scotland by John Laurie This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The History of the Wars in Scotland by John Laurie Anno 85 Grampian Hill's Battle this battle was fought during the time Agricola had the command in Britain. This is one of the most remarkable engagements we read of in history. Agricola, having defeated the British in former skirmishes, closely pursued them till they came to the Grampian Hills, where, notwithstanding their former defeats, they made a bold stand. After each general had harangued his men, in most elegant and animated speeches, the Romans, says Tacitus, while their general was speaking, appeared full of ardor, but when he had done, they freely vented their joy by running to their weapons. As they were thus animated and running forwards, he put them in order of battle, posting eight thousand auxiliary foot in the center and three thousand horse in the wings. The legions he ranged before the trenches, supposing it would add much to his glory if he could gain a victory without the effusion of Roman blood, or at least keep them as a reserve in case of a repulse. The British general drew up his men on the higher ground, chiefly for show and terror. But as the foremost battalions stood on the level, the rest, rising one above another along the hill, the chariots and horsemen filled the middle of the hill, whirling up and down with a hideous noise. Agricola, perceiving their numbers superior to his, widened his ranks, that he might not be charged in flank and front, so that his army became thinner as well as more extended. Some advised him to order his legions to advance, but he, being a courageous man and resolute in danger, alighted from his horse and fought on foot before the ensigns. The battle began at a distance, which the Britons managed with great dexterity and resolution, and, with their short bucklers and great swords, warded off the missile weapons of their enemies. At the same time poured upon them a shower of darts, till Agricola encouraged three Batavian and two Tungrian cohorts to fall upon them sword in hand, which they, being old experienced soldiers, performed with great advantage for the Britons, who bore little shields and large swords without points, were a very unequal match for them. The Batavians, making dreadful havoc with their swords, striking their enemies even with the bosses of their bucklers, bruising their faces, and pushing some aside who, upon even ground, opposed their passage, advanced up the hill. The other cohorts, ashamed to be outdone by them, slew all about them and often, to accelerate the victory, they left men half dead behind them, and others untouched. In the meantime the horse fled, and the chariots, mingling with the foot, occasioned new consternation. But their career was stopped by the unequal ground and their close ranks. Keeping their ground, they bear all down before them by the weight of their horses. But wandering chariots, with frighted horses, without riders, trample down friend and foe, and make prodigious havoc. The Britons on the top of the hill, disdaining the small force of the Romans, began gradually to descend, and would have surrounded their victorious troops if Agricola, who suspected that design, had not detached four squadrons of horse, which were kept as reserves to oppose them. These put them to flight as soon as they came to the assault. Some squadrons, who fought in the front, were ordered to leave the fight and pursue the fugitives. It was a most dismal spectacle to behold the open plain, in one place the Romans pursuing, wounding some, killing others, and taking some prisoners, 
whilst in another place the courageous Britons turned upon their pursuers, and rather than be taken prisoners, some of them, naked and unarmed, rushed upon the swords of their foes, and thereby exposed themselves to a voluntary death. All the field was strewn with weapons, limbs, and dead bodies of men, and the earth was dyed with blood. Many, though expiring, retained their fierceness. As soon as the Britons approached the woods, they turned and encompassed the eager pursuers who knew not the woods. But Agricola, having secured the woods with the stoutest and lightest cohorts, totally broke and routed the Britons. Tacitus supposes that ten thousand of the Britons and only three hundred and forty of the Romans were killed. Had not the Britons been deficient in military discipline, it is more than probable that few of Agricola's army would have survived to carry the tidings of their defeat to Rome. End of Grampian Hill's Battle From the History of the Wars in Scotland By John Lorry An Act for Laying an Additional Duty Upon Slaves Imported into this Colony By the Virginia House of Burgesses this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. An Act for Laying an Additional Duty Upon Slaves. First, whereas it is found expedient by this present General Assembly that an additional duty should be laid upon all slaves imported or brought into this colony, to be paid by the buyers, be it therefore enacted by the governor, council, and burgesses of this present general assembly, and it is hereby enacted by the authority of the same, that from and after the passing of this act, there shall be levied and paid to our sovereign lord the king, his heirs and successors, for all slaves imported or brought into this colony for sale, either by land or water, from any port or place whatsoever, by the buyer or purchaser, ten per centum on the amount of each respective purchase, over and above the several duties already laid upon slaves imported or brought into this colony, as aforesaid, by any act or acts of assembly now subsisting in this colony, which said additional duty shall be paid, collected, and accounted for, in such manner and form, and according to such rules, and under such penalties and forfeitures, as are mentioned, prescribed, and appointed for paying, collecting, and accounting, for the duties already imposed upon slaves imported or brought into the said colony, by the several acts of assembly now in force. Second, and be it further enacted, that the said duty be, and the same is hereby appropriated for, and towards defraying the contingent charges of this government, and to and for such other use and uses as the General Assembly, from time to time, shall direct and appoint. Third, and be it further enacted, by the authority aforesaid, that the execution of this act shall be suspended, until His Majesty's approbation thereof shall be obtained, and that from and after obtaining the same, this act shall continue, and be in force for and during the term of seven years, and no longer. End of An Act for Laying an Additional Duty Upon Slaves Imported into This Colony Additional Instruction to Our Lieutenant and Governor General of Our Colony and Dominion of Virginia in America or Our Commander-in-Chief of Our Said Colony for the Time Being by George William Frederick This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. Additional instruction to our Lieutenant and Governor General of our Colony and Dominion of Virginia in America, or our Commander-in-Chief of our said colony for the time being. Given at our court at St. James's, the 10th day of December, 1770, in the eleventh year of our reign. Whereas at a general assembly begun and held in our city of Williamsburg in our colony and dominion of Virginia, on the seventh day of November in the tenth year of our reign, two laws were framed and enacted by our governor, council, 
and house of burgesses of our said colony and dominion of virginia the one entitled an act for laying an additional duty upon slaves imported into this colony the other an act for the better support of the contingent charges of government by which said laws additional duties accounting to fifteen per cent were imposed upon every purchase of slaves imported or brought into that colony over and above a like duty of ten per cent payable by former laws then in force and whereas it hath been represented to us that so considerable an increase upon the duties of slaves imported into our colony of virginia will have the effect to prejudice and obstruct as well the commerce of this kingdom as the cultivation and improvement of the said colony whereupon we have thought fit to disallow the first mentioned of the laws leaving the other which is of short duration to expire by its own limitation it is therefore our will and pleasure that you do not, upon pain of our highest displeasure, give your assent for the future, without our royal permission first obtained, to any law or laws, by which the additional duty of five per cent, upon slaves imported, imposed by the last mentioned law, shall be further continued, or to any law or laws whatever, by which the duties of ten per cent upon slaves imported into our said colony, payable by laws last antecedent to the seventh day of november seventeen sixty nine shall upon any pretense be increased or by which the importation of slaves shall be in any respect prohibited or obstructed end of additional instruction to our lieutenant and governor-general by george william frederick Virginia Colony to George the Third of England, April 1, 1772. Petition against importation of slaves from Africa, by the Virginia House of Burgesses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by the Progressing America Project. Virginia Colony to George the Third of England, April 1, 1772. Petition against importation of slaves from Africa. Most gracious Sovereign, we, Your Majesty's dutiful and loyal subjects, the Burgesses of Virginia, now meet in General Assembly, beg leave with all humility to approach Your Royal Presence. The many instances of Your Majesty's benevolent intentions and most gracious disposition to promote the prosperity and happiness of your subjects in the colonies, encourage us to look up to the throne, and implore your majesty's paternal assistance in averting a calamity of the most alarming nature. The importation of slaves into the colonies from the coast of Africa hath long been considered as a trade of great inhumanity, and, under its present encouragement, we have too much reason to fear will endanger the very existence of your majesty's american dominions we are sensible that some of your majesty's subjects in great britain may reap emoluments from this sort of traffic but when we consider that it greatly retards the settlement of the colonies with more useful inhabitants and may in time have the most destructive influence we presume to hope that the interest of a few will be disregarded when placed in competition with the security and happiness of such numbers of your majesty's dutiful and loyal subjects deeply impressed with these sentiments we most humbly beseech your majesty to remove all those restraints on your majesty's governors of this colony which inhibit their assenting to such laws as might check so very pernicious a commerce your majesty's ancient colony and dominion of virginia hath at all times and upon every occasion been entirely devoted to your majesty's sacred person and government and we cannot forego this opportunity of renewing those assurances of the truest loyalty and warmest affection which we have so often with the greatest sincerity given to the best of kings whose wisdom and goodness we esteem the surest pledge of the happiness of all his people End of Virginia Colony to George the Third of England. Intertetra, the doctrine of discovery, May third and May fourth, fourteen ninety three. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Papal Bulls of 1493 by Pope Alexander VI. Translator Unknown. Inter Chaetera, May 3rd and 4th, 1493. Papal Bull of May 3rd. Alexander, etc., to the illustrious sovereigns, our very dear son in Christ, Ferdinand, king, and our very dear daughter in Christ, Elizabeth, Isabella, queen of Castile and Leon, Aragon, Sicily, and Granada, health and apostolic benediction. Among other works well-pleasing to his divine majesty and cherished of our heart, this assuredly ranks highest, that in our times especially, the catholic faith and the christian religion be everywhere increased and spread as well as that the health of souls be procured and barbarous nations overthrown and brought to the faith itself wherefore inasmuch as by the favour of divine clemency through no fitting merits of ours we have been raised to this holy see of peter recognising that as true catholic kings and princes such as we have always known you to be and as your illustrious deeds, already known to almost the whole world, declare, you not only eagerly desire, but with every effort, zeal, and diligence, without regard to hardships, expenses, dangers, with the shedding even of your blood, are laboring to that end, recognizing besides that already you have long ago dedicated to this purpose your whole soul and all your endeavors, as witnessed in these times with so much glory to the divine name in your recovery of the kingdom of granada from the yoke of the moors we therefore not unrighteously hold it as our duty to grant you even of our own accord and in your favour those things whereby daily and with heartier effort you may be enabled for the honour of god himself and the spread of the christian rule to accomplish your saintly and praiseworthy purpose so pleasing to immortal god in sooth we have learned that, according to your purpose long ago, you were in quest of some faraway islands and mainlands not hitherto discovered by others, to the end that you might bring to the worship of our Redeemer and profession of the Catholic faith the inhabitants of them with the dwellers therein, that hitherto, having been earnestly engaged in the siege and recovery of the kingdom itself of Granada, you were unable to accomplish this saintly and praiseworthy purpose, but at length, as was pleasing to the Lord, the said kingdom having been regained, not without the greatest hardships, dangers, and expenses, we have also learned that with the wish to fulfill your desire, you chose our beloved son Christopher Colon, whom you furnished with ships and men equipped for like designs, so as to make diligent quest for these far away unknown countries through the sea, which hitherto no one has sailed, who in fine, with divine aid, nor without the utmost diligence sailing in the ocean sea, as said, through western waters towards the Indies, discovered certain very far away islands and even mainlands that hitherto had not been discovered by others. Therein dwell very many peoples living in peace, and as reported going unclothed, nor users of flesh meat. Moreover, as your aforesaid envoys are of opinion, these very peoples, living in the said islands and countries, believe in one God, Creator in heaven, besides being sufficiently ready in appearance to embrace the Catholic faith and be trained in good morals. Nor is hope lacking that, were they instructed, the name of the Saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ, would easily be introduced into the said countries and islands. Besides, on one of these aforesaid chief islands, the above-mentioned Christopher has already had put together and built a fortress, fairly well equipped, wherein he has stationed as garrison certain Christians, companions of his, who are to make search for other far-away and unknown islands and countries. In the islands and countries already discovered are found gold, spices, and very many other precious things of diverse kinds and species. Wherefore, as becoming to Catholic kings and princes, after earnest consideration of all matters, especially of the rise and spread of the Catholic faith, as was the fashion of your ancestors, kings of renowned memory, you have purposed with the favour of divine clemency to bring under your sway the said countries and islands with their inhabitants and the dwellers therein, and bring them to the Catholic faith. 
Hence, in heartiest commendation in the Lord of this your saintly and praiseworthy purpose, desirous too that it be duly accomplished in the carrying to those regions of the name of our Saviour, we exhort you very earnestly in the Lord, and insist strictly, both through your reception of holy baptism, whereby you are bound to our apostolic commands, and through the bowels of the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, that inasmuch as with upright spirit and through zeal for the true faith you design to equip and dispatch this expedition, you purpose also, as is your duty, to lead the peoples dwelling in those islands to embrace the Christian profession, nor at any time let dangers or hardships deter you therefrom, with the stout hope and trust in your hearts that Almighty God will further your undertakings. Moreover, in order that with greater readiness and hardiness you enter upon an undertaking of so lofty a character as has been entrusted to you by the graciousness of our apostolic favor, we, moved thereunto by our own accord, not at your instance nor the request of any one else in your regard, but of our own sole largesse and certain knowledge, as well as in the fullness of our apostolic power, by the authority of Almighty God conferred upon us in blessed Peter, and of the vicarship of Jesus Christ, which we hold on earth, do by tenor of these presents give, grant, and assign for ever to you and your heirs and successors, kings of Castile and Leon, all, and singular, the aforesaid countries and islands thus unknown and hitherto discovered by your envoys, and to be discovered hereafter, providing, however, they at no time have been in the actual temporal possession of any Christian owner, together with all their dominions, cities, camps, places, and towns, as well as all rights, jurisdictions, and appurtenances of the same wherever they may be found. Moreover, we invest you and your aforementioned heirs and successors with them, and make a point and depute you owners of them with full and free power, authority, and jurisdiction of every kind. With this proviso, however, that by this gift, grant, assignment, and investiture of ours, no right conferred on any Christian prince is hereby to be understood as withdrawn or to be withdrawn. Moreover, we command you, in virtue of holy obedience, that, employing all due diligence in the premises, as you promise, nor do we doubt your compliance therewith to the best of your loyalty and royal greatness of spirit, you send to the aforesaid countries and islands worthy, God-fearing, learned, skilled, and experienced men in order to instruct the aforesaid inhabitants and dwellers therein, in the Catholic faith, and train them in good morals. Besides, under penalty of excommunication, late sententiae, to be incurred ipso facto, should any one thus contravene, we strictly forbid all persons, of no matter what rank, estate, degree, order, or condition, to dare without your special permit, or that of your aforesaid heirs and successors, to go for the sake of trade, or any other purpose whatever, to the said islands and countries discovered and found by your envoys or persons sent thither. And, inasmuch as some kings of Portugal, by similar apostolic grant made to them, discovered and took possession of islands in the waters of Africa, Guinea, and the gold mine, as well as elsewhere, for which reason diverse privileges, favors, liberties, immunities, exemptions, and indults were granted to them by this apostolic see, we, through similar accord, authority, knowledge, and fullness of our apostolic power, by a gift of special favor, do empower you and your aforesaid heirs and successors in the islands and countries discovered and to be discovered by you, to use, employ, and enjoy, freely and legally as is right, in all things and through all things, the same as if they had been especially granted to you and your aforesaid heirs and successors, all and singular, these favors, privileges, exemptions, liberties, faculties, immunities, and indults, whereof the term of all we wish understood as being sufficiently expressed and inserted, the same as if they had been inserted word for word in these presents. Moreover, we similarly extend and enlarge them in all things and through all things in favor of you and your aforesaid heirs and successors, the apostolic constitutions and ordinances as well as all those things that have been granted in the letters above, or other things whatsoever to the contrary, notwithstanding. We trust in him from whom derive empires and governments and everything good, 
that with the guidance of the Lord over your deeds, should you pursue this saintly and praiseworthy undertaking, in a short while your hardships and endeavors will result in the utmost success to the happiness and glory of all Christendom. But inasmuch as it would be difficult to have these present letters sent to all places where desirable, we wish, and with similar accord and knowledge, do decree that to copies of them, signed by the hand of a notary public commission, therefore, and sealed with the seal of any ecclesiastical officer or ecclesiastical court, the same respect is to be shown in court and outside as well as anywhere else, as would be given to these presents, should they be exhibited or shown. Let no one, therefore, infringe or with rash boldness contravene this our exhortation, requisition, gift, grant, assignment, investiture, deed, constitution, deputation, mandate, inhibition, indult, exemption, enlargement, will, and decree. Should any one presume to do so, be it known to him that he will incur the wrath of Almighty God and of the blessed apostles Peter and Paul given in Rome at St. Peter's on the third day of May in the year 1493 of the Incarnation of our Lord in the first year of our pontificate, gratis by order of our Most Holy Lord the Pope, B. Capotius, D. Serrano, Cola A. de Compania, N. Casanova. Papal Bull of May 4th. Alexander, etc., to the illustrious sovereigns, our very dear son in Christ, Ferdinand, King, and our very dear daughter in Christ, Elizabeth, Isabella, Queen of Castile and Leon, Aragon, Sicily, and Granada, Health, etc., among other works well-pleasing to his divine majesty and cherished of our heart, this assuredly ranks highest that in our times especially the Catholic faith and the Christian law be exalted, and everywhere increased and spread, as well as that the health of souls be procured, and barbarous nations overthrown and brought to the faith itself. Wherefore, inasmuch as by the favor of divine clemency, through no fitting merits of ours, we have been raised to so holy a sea as Peter's, recognizing that as true Catholic kings and princes such as we have always known you to be, and as your illustrious deeds, already known to almost the whole world, declare, you not only eagerly desire, but with every effort, zeal, and diligence, without regard to hardships, expenses, dangers, with the shedding even of your blood, are laboring to that end, that besides you have already long ago dedicated to this purpose your whole soul and all your endeavors, as witnessed in these times with so much glory to the divine name in your recovery of the kingdom of Granada from the yoke of the Moors. We therefore, not unrighteously, hold it as our duty to grant you even of our own accord, and in your favor those things whereby daily and with heartier effort you may be enabled for the honor of God himself and the spread of the Christian rule, to accomplish your saintly and praiseworthy purpose so pleasing to immortal God. In sooth, we have learned that according to your purpose long ago, you were in quest of some faraway islands and mainlands not hitherto discovered by others, to the end that you might bring to the worship of our Redeemer and the profession of the Catholic faith, the inhabitants of them with the dwellers therein, that hitherto, having been earnestly engaged in the siege and recovery of the kingdom itself of Granada, you were unable to accomplish this saintly and praiseworthy purpose, but at length, as was pleasing to the Lord, the said kingdom having been regained, not without the greatest hardships, dangers, and expenses, that with the wish to fulfill your desire, you chose our beloved son, Christopher Colon, a man assuredly worthy and of the highest recommendations as well as furnished with ships and men equipped for like designs, to make diligent quest for these far away unknown mainlands and islands through the sea, where hitherto no one has sailed, who in fine, with divine aid, nor without the utmost diligence, sailing in the ocean sea, discovered certain very far away islands, and even mainlands that hitherto had not been discovered by others, wherein dwell very many peoples living in peace, 
and as reported, going unclothed, nor users of flesh meat. And as your aforesaid envoys are of opinion, these very peoples living in the said islands and countries believe in one God, Creator in heaven, besides being sufficiently ready in appearance to embrace the Catholic faith and be trained in good morals. Nor is hope lacking that were they instructed the name of the Saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ, would easily be introduced into the said countries and islands. Besides, on one of these aforesaid chief islands, the said Christopher has already had put together and built a well-equipped fortress, wherein he has stationed as garrison certain Christians, companions of his, who are to make search for other far away and unknown islands and mainlands. In certain islands and countries already discovered are found gold, spices, and very many other precious things of diverse kinds and species. Wherefore, as becoming to Catholic kings and princes, after earnest consideration of all matters, especially of the rise and spread of the Catholic faith, as was the fashion of your ancestors, kings of renowned memory, you have purposed with the favour of divine clemency to bring under your sway the said mainlands and islands with their inhabitants and the dwellers therein, and bring them to the Catholic faith. Hence, in heartiest commendation in the Lord of this your saintly and praiseworthy purpose, desirous too that it be duly accomplished in the carrying to those regions of the name of our Saviour, we exhort you very earnestly in the Lord, and insist strictly both through your reception of holy baptism, whereby you are bound to our apostolic commands, and in the bowels of the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, that inasmuch as with upright spirit and through zeal for the true faith you design to equip and dispatch this expedition, you purpose also, as is your duty, to lead the peoples dwelling in those islands and countries to embrace the Christian religion, nor at any time let dangers nor hardships deter you therefrom, with the stout hope and trust in your hearts that Almighty God will further your undertakings. Moreover, moved thereunto by our own accord, not at your instance, nor the request of any one else in your regard, but wholly of our own largesse and certain knowledge as well as fullness of our apostolic power, by the authority of Almighty God conferred upon us in blessed Peter, and of the vicarship of Jesus Christ, which we hold on earth, in order that with greater readiness and heartiness you enter upon an undertaking of so lofty a character as has been entrusted to you, by the graciousness of our apostolic favour. By tenor of these presents, should any of said islands have been found by your envoys and captains, we do give grant and assign to you, and your heirs and successors, kings of Castile and Leon, for ever, together with all their dominions, cities, camps, places, and towns, as well as all rights, jurisdictions, and appurtenances, all islands and mainlands found and to be found, discovered and to be discovered towards the west and south, by drawing and establishing a line from the Arctic Pole namely the north, to the Antarctic pole, namely the south, no matter whether the said mainlands and islands are found and to be found in the direction of India or towards any other quarter, the said line to the west and south to be distant one hundred leagues from any of the islands commonly known as the Azores and Cabo Verde. With this proviso, however, that none of the islands and mainlands found and to be found discovered and to be discovered beyond that said line towards the west and south, be in the actual possession of any Christian king or prince up to the birthday of our Lord Jesus Christ just passed in the present year 1493. Moreover, we make, appoint, and depute you and your said heirs and successors, owners of them, with full and free power, authority, and jurisdiction of every kind, with this proviso, however, that through this gift, grant, and assignment of ours, no right conferred on any Christian prince, who may be in actual possession of said islands and mainlands up to the said birthday of our Lord Jesus Christ, is hereby to be considered as withdrawn, or to be withdrawn. Moreover, we command you, in virtue of holy obedience, 
that employing all due diligence in the premises as you promise, nor do we doubt your compliance therein to the best of your loyalty and royal greatness of spirit, you send to the aforesaid mainlands and islands worthy, God-fearing, learned, skilled, and experienced men, in order to instruct the aforesaid inhabitants and dwellers therein in the Catholic faith and train them in good morals. Besides, under penalty of excommunication, late sententiae, to be incurred ipso facto, should any one thus contravene, we strictly forbid all persons of whatsoever rank, even imperial and royal, or of whatsoever estate, degree, order, or condition, to dare, without your special permit, or that of your aforesaid heirs and successors, to go as charged for the purpose of trade or any other reason to the islands and mainlands found and to be found, discovered and to be discovered, towards the west and south by drawing and establishing a line from the Arctic Pole to the Antarctic Pole, no matter whether the mainlands and islands found and to be found lie in the direction of India or towards any other quarter whatsoever, the said line to the west and south to be distant one hundred leagues from any of the islands commonly known as the Azores and Cabo Verde. The apostolic constitutions and ordinances and other decrees whatsoever to the contrary, notwithstanding. We trust in him from whom derive empires and governments and everything good, that with his guidance, should you pursue this saintly and praiseworthy undertaking, in a short while your hardships and endeavours will result in the utmost success to the happiness and glory of all Christendom. But, inasmuch as it would be difficult to have these present letters sent to all places where desirable, we wish, and with similar accord and knowledge do decree, that to copies of them, signed by the hand of any public notary commissioned therefore, and sealed with the seal of any ecclesiastical officer, or ecclesiastical court, the same respect is to be shown in court and outside as well as anywhere else, as would be given to these presents, should they thus be exhibited or shown. Let no one, therefore, etc., infringe, etc. This our recommendation, gift, grant, assignment, constitution, deputation, decree, mandate, prohibition, and will, should any one, etc., given at Rome, at St. Peter's, in the year, etc., 1,493, the fourth of May, and the first year of our pontificate. Gratis, by order of our Most Holy Lord, the Pope, D. Galectus, for the Registrar, A. de Mucciarelis, Collator, L. Amerinus. End of Intertaetera of May 3rd and 4th Read by Sandra, near Montreal, 2022papal bulls of 1493 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org papal bulls of 1493 extension of the apostolic grant and donation of the indies september 25th by pope alexander VI. translator unknown Alexander, Bishop, Servant of the Servants of God, to the illustrious Sovereigns, his very dear son in Christ, Fernando, Ferdinand, King, and his very dear daughter in Christ, Isabel, Queen of Castile, Leon, Aragon, Granada, health and apostolic benediction. A short while ago, through our own accord, certain knowledge and fullness of our apostolic power, we gave conveyed and assigned forever to you and your heirs and successors kings of castile and leon all islands and mainlands whatsoever discovered and to be discovered towards the west and south that were not under the actual temporal rule of any christian owner moreover investing therewith you and your aforesaid heirs and successors we appointed and deputed you as owners of them with full and free power, authority, and jurisdiction of every kind, 
as more fully appears in our letters given to that effect, the terms whereof we wish to be understood the same as if they had been inserted word for word in these presents. But it may happen that your envoys, captains, or vassals, while voyaging towards the west or south, might land and touch in eastern waters, and there discover islands and mainlands, that at one time belonged, or even yet, belong to India. With the desire, then, to give you token of our graciousness, through similar accord, knowledge, and fullness of our power, by tenor of these presents and our apostolic authority, we do extend and enlarge our aforesaid gift, grant, assignment, and letters, with all and singular, the clauses contained therein, so as to secure to you all islands and mainlands whatsoever that are found, and to be found, discovered, and to be discovered, are, or were, or seem to be, in the route by sea or land, to the west or south, but are now recognized as being in the waters of the west or south and east, and India. Moreover, in all, and through all, the same as if in the aforesaid letters full and express mention had been made thereof, we convey to you and your aforesaid heirs and successors full and free power, through your own authority, exercised through yourselves or by the action of another or of others, to take corporal possession of the said islands and countries and to hold them for ever, as well as to defend your right thereto against whomsoever may seek to prevent it, with this strict prohibition, however, to all persons of no matter what rank, estate, degree, order, or condition, that under penalty of excommunication, late sententiae, wherein such as contravene are to be considered as having fallen ipso facto, no one without your express leave or that of your aforesaid heirs and successors shall, for no matter what reason or pretense, presume in any manner to go or send to the aforesaid regions, for the purpose of fishing or of searching for any islands or mainlands, notwithstanding any apostolic constitutions and ordinances or whatsoever gifts, grants, powers, and assignments of the aforesaid regions, seas, islands, and countries, or any portion of them, may have been made by us or our predecessors in favor of whatsoever kings, princes, infantes, or whatsoever other persons, orders, or knighthoods, who for any reason whatever may now be there, even for motives of charity, or the faith, or the ransom of captives. Nor shall it matter how urgent these reasons may be, even though based on repealing clauses they may appear of the most positive, mandatory, and unusual character, nor even should there be contained therein sentences, censures, and penalties of any kind whatever, providing, however, these have not gone into effect through actual and real possession, nay, even though it may have happened on occasion that the persons to whom such gifts and grants were made, or their envoys, sailed thither through chance. Wherefore, should any such gifts or grants have been made, considering the terms of our present decree to have been sufficiently expressed and inserted, we, through similar accord, knowledge, and fullness of our power, do wholly revoke the former. Moreover, as regards countries and islands not in actual possession of others, we wish this to be considered as of no effect, notwithstanding what may appear in the foresaid letters, or anything else to the contrary, given at Rome at St. Peter's on the twenty-fifth day of September in the year of the incarnation of our Lord, 1493, the second year of our pontificate. End of the Papal Bull of September 25th Read by Sandra, near Montreal, 2022. Chapters 1 and 8 From Salem Witchcraft and Cotton Mather By Charles W. Upham This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1 the connection of the Mathers with the superstitions of their time. In the first place, I venture to say that it can admit of no doubt that Increase Mather and his son, Cotton Mather, did more than any other persons to aggravate the tendency of that age to the result reached in the witchcraft illusion of 1692. The latter, in the beginning of the sixth book of the Magnalia Christi Americana, 
refers to an attempt made about the year 1658. Among some divines of no little figure throughout England and Ireland for the faithful registering of remarkable providences, but alas, he says, it came to nothing that was remarkable. The like holy design, he continues, was by the Reverend Increase Mather, proposed among the divines of New England in the year 1681, that a general meeting of them, who thereupon desired him to begin and publish an essay, which he did in a little while, but therewithal declared that he did it only as a specimen of a larger volume, in hopes that his work, being set on foot, posterity would go along with it. Cotton Mather did go on with it. Immediately upon his entrance to the ministry, and by their preaching, publications, correspondence at home and abroad, and the influence of their learnings, talents, industry, and zeal in the work, these two men provoked the prevalence of a passion for the marvellous and monstrous. And what was deemed preternatural, infernal, and diabolical throughout the whole mass of the people, in England as well as America, the public mind became infatuated, and, drugged with credulity and superstition, were prepared to receive any impulse of blind fanaticism. The stories, thus collected and put everywhere in circulation, were of a nature to terrify the imagination, fill the mind with horrible apprehensions, degrade the general intelligence and taste, and dethrone the reason. They darken and dishonor the literature of that period. A rehash of them can be found in the sixth book of the Magnalia. The effect of such publications were naturally developed in widespread delusions and universal credulity. They penetrated the whole body of society, and reached all the inhabitants and families of the land, in the towns, and the remotest settlements. In this way, the Mathers, particularly the younger, made themselves responsible for the diseased and bewildered state of the public mind in reference and supernatural and diabolical agencies which came to a head in the witchcraft delusion i do not say that they were culpable undoubtedly they thought they were doing god's service but the influence they exercised in this direction remains none the less an historical fact increase mather applied himself without delay to the prosecution of the design he had proposed by writing to persons in all parts of the country particularly clergymen, to procure for publication as many marvellous stories as could be raked up. In the eighth volume of the fourth series of the collections of the Massachusetts Historical Society, consisting of the Mather Papers, the responses of several of his correspondents may be seen. He pursued this business with an industrious and pertinacious zeal, which nothing could slacken. After the rest of the world had been shocked out of such mischievous nonsense, by the horrid results at Salem, on the 5th of March, 1694, as president of Harvard College, he issued a circular to the reverend ministers of the gospel in the several churches in New England, signed by himself and seven other members of the corporation of that institution, urging it, as the special duty of the ministers of the gospel, to obtain and preserve knowledge of notable occurrences described under the general head of remarkables and classified as follows the things to be esteemed memorable are especially all unusual incidents in the heaven or earth or water all wonderful deliverances of the distressed mercies to the godly judgments to the wicked and more glorious fulfillments of either the promises or the threatenings in the scripture of truth with apparitions possessions enchantments and all extraordinary things wherein the existence and agency of the invisible world is more sensibly demonstrated magnalia christi americana edit london seventeen o two book six page one all communications in answer to this missive were to be addressed to the president and fellows of harvard college the first article is as follows to observe and record the more illustrious discoveries of the divine providence in the government of the world is a design so holy so useful so justly approved that the too general neglect of it in the churches of god is as justly to be lamented it is important to consider this language in connection with that used by cotton mather in opening the sixth book of the magnalia to regard the illustrious displays of that providence 
wherewith our Lord Christ governs the world, is a work, then, which there is none more needful or useful for a Christian. To record them is a work, then, which none more proper for a minister, and perhaps the great governor of the world, will ordinarily do the most notable things for those who are most ready to take a wise notice of what he does. Unaccountable, therefore, and inexcusable, is the sleepiness, even upon the most of good men throughout the world, which indisposes them to observe and, much more, to preserve the remarkable dispensations of divine providence towards themselves or others. Nevertheless, there have been raised up, now and then, those persons who have rendered themselves worthy of everlasting remembrance, by their wakeful zeal to have the memorable providences of God remembered through all generations. These passages from the Mathers, Father and Son, embrace, in their beginnings, a period eleven years before and two years after the delusion of 1692. They show that the clergy, generally, were indifferent to the subject, and required to be aroused from neglect and sleepiness, touching the duty of flooding the public mind with stories of wonders and remarkables, and that the agency of the Mathers in giving currency by means of their ministry and influence to such ideas, was peculiar and preeminent. However innocent and excusable their motives may have been, the laws of cause and effect remain unbroken, and the result of their actions are, with truth and justice, attributable to them. Not necessarily, I repeat, to impeach their honesty and integrity, but their wisdom, taste, judgment, and common sense. Human responsibility is not to be set aside nor avoided, merely and wholly by good intent. It involves a solemn and fearful obligation to the use of reason, caution, cool deliberation, circumspection, and a most careful calculation of consequences. Error, if innocent and honest, is not punishable by divine and ought not to be by human law. It is covered by the mercy of God, and must not be pursued by the animosity of men but it is, nevertheless, a thing to be dreaded and to be guarded against, with the utmost vigilance. Throughout the melancholy annals of the church and the world, it has been the fountain of innumerable woes, spreading baleful influences through society, paralyzing the energies of reason and conscience, dimming all but extinguishing the light of religion, convulsing nations, and desolating the earth. It is the duty of historians to trace it to its source, and, by depicting faithfully the causes that have led to it, prevent its reoccurrence. With these views, I feel bound, distinctly, to state that the impression given to the popular sentiments of the period, to which I am referring, by certain leading minds, led to, was the efficient cause of, and, in this sense, may be said to have originated the awful superstitions long prevalent in the old world and the new, and reaching a final catastrophe in 1692. And among these leading minds, aggravating and intensifying, by their writings, this most baleful form of the superstition of the age, Increase and Cotton Mather, stand most conspicuous. This opinion was entertained, at the time, by impartial observers, Francis Hutchinson, D.D., chaplain in ordinary to his majesty and minister of St. James Parish in St. Edmundsbury. In the lifetime of both the Mathers published in London, an historical essay concerning witchcraft, dedicated to the Lord Chief Justice of England, the Lord Chief Justice of Common Pleas, and the Lord Chief Baron of Exchequer. In a chapter on the witchcraft in Salem, Boston, and Andover in New England, he attributes it, as will be seen in the course of this article, to the influence of the writings of the Mathers. In the preface to the London edition of Cotton Mather's Memorable Providences, written by Richard Baxter in 1690, he ascribes the same prominence to the works of the Mathers, while expressing the great value he attached to writings about witchcraft and the importance, in his view, of that department of literature which relates stories about diabolical agency possessions, apparitions, and the like. He says, Mr. Increase Mather hath already published many such histories of things done in New England, and this great instance published by his son, that is, the account of the Goodwin children, cometh with such full convincing evidence that he must be a very obdurate Sadducee that will not believe it. 
and his two sermons adjoined are excellently fitted to the subject and this blinded generation and to the use of us all that are not past our warfare with devils one of the sermons which baxter commends is on the power and malice of devils and opens with the declaration that there is a combination of devils which our air is filled with all the other is on witchcraft both are replete with the most exciting and vehement enforcements of the superstitions of that age relating to the devil and his confederates my first position then in contravention of that taken by the reviewer in the north american is that by stimulating the clergy over the whole country to collect and circulate all sorts of marvellous and supposed preternatural occurrences by giving this direction to the preaching and literature of the time these two active zealous learned and able divines increase in cotton mather considering the influence they naturally were able to exercise are particularly the latter justly chargeable with and may be said to have brought about the extraordinary outbreaks of credulous fanaticism exhibited in the cases of the goodwin family and of the afflicted children at salem village robert caliph writing to the ministers of the country march eighteen sixteen ninety four says i having had not only occasion but renewed provocation to take a view of the mysterious doctrines which have of late been so much contested among us could not meet with any that had spoken more or more plainly the sense of those doctrines relating to witchcraft than the rev mr cotton mather but how clearly and consistent either with himself or the truth i meddle not now to say but cannot but suppose his strenuous and zealous asserting his opinions has been one cause of the dismal convulsions we have here lately fallen into more wonders of the invisible world by robert caliph merchant of boston in new england edit london seventeen hundred page thirty three the papers that remain connected with the witchcraft examinations and trials at salem show the extent to which currency had been given in the popular mind to such marvellous and prodigious things as the mathers had been so long endeavouring to collect and circulate particularly in the interior rural settlements the solemn solitudes of the woods were filled with ghosts hobgoblins spectres evil spirits and the infernal prince of them all every pathway was infested with their flitting shapes and footprints and around every hearthstone shuddering circles drawing closer together as the darkness of night thickened and their imaginations became more awed and frightened listened to the tales of diabolical operations the same effects in somewhat different forms pervaded the seaboard settlements and larger towns besides such frightful fancies other most unhappy influences flowed from the prevalence of the style of literature which the mathers brought into vogue suspicions and accusations of witchcraft were everywhere prevalent any unusual calamity or misadventure every instance of real or affected singularity of deportment or behaviour and in that condition of perverted and distempered public opinion there would be many such was attributed to the devil every sufferer who had yielded his mind to what was taught in pulpits or publications lost sight of the divine hand and could see nothing but the devils in his afflictions poor john goodwin whose trials we are presently to consider while his children were acting as the phrase originating in those days and still lingering in the lower forms of vulgar speech has it like all possessed broke forth thus i thought of what david said to samuel twenty four fourteen if he feared so to fall into the hands of men oh then to think of the horrors of our condition to be in the hands of devils and witches thus our doleful condition moved us to call to our friends to have pity on us for god's hand hath touched us i was ready to say that no one's affliction was like mine that my little house that should be a little bethel for god to dwell in should be made a den of devils that those little bodies that should be temples for the holy ghost to dwell in should be thus harassed and abused by the devil and his curse brood late memorable providences relating to witchcraft and possessions by cotton mather edit london sixteen ninety one 
No wonder that the country was full of the terrors and horrors of diabolical imaginations when the devil was kept before the minds of men by what they constantly read and heard from their religious teachers. In the sermons of that day, he was the all-absorbing topic of learning and eloquence. In some of Cotton Mather's, the name devil, or its synonyms, is mentioned ten times as often as that of the benign and blessed God. No wonder that alleged witchcrafts were numerous. Drake, in his History of Boston, says, There were many cases there, about the year 1688. Only one of them seems to have attracted the kind of notice requisite to preserve it from oblivion, that of the four children of John Goodwin. The eldest, thirteen years of age, the relation of this case in my book, was wholly drawn from the memorable providences and the magnalia. Chapter 8. Cotton Mather and Spectral Evidence I shall continue to draw at some length upon Mather's writings, to which I ask the careful attention of the reader. The subject, to which they mostly relate, is of most interest, presenting views of a class of topics, holding for a long period a mighty sway over the human mind. In his Life of Phipps, written in 1697 and constituting the concluding part of the second book of the Magnalia, he gives a general account of what had transpired in the preliminary examinations at Salem, before the arrival of Sir William at Boston. In it, he spreads out with considerable fullness what had been brought before the magistrates, consisting mainly of spectral testimony, and narrates the appearances and doings of spectres assaulting the afflicted children. Not as mere matters alleged, but as facts. It is true that he appears as a narrator. Yet, in the manner and tenor of his statement, he cannot but be considered as endorsing the spectral evidence. Speaking of the examining magistrates and saying that it is now, that is, in 1697, generally thought that they went out of the way, he expresses himself as follows. The afflicted people vehemently accuse several persons in several places that the specters which afflicted them did exactly resemble them until the importunity of the accusations did provoke the magistrates to examine them. When many of the accused came upon their examination, it was found that the demons, then a thousand ways abusing of the poor afflicted people, had with a marvelous exactness represented them. Yea, it was found that many of the accused, but casting their eye upon the afflicted, the afflicted, though their faces were never so much another way, would fall down and lie in a sort of a swoon, when they would continue whatever hands were laying upon them, until the hands of the accused came to touch them, and then they would revive immediately. And it was found that the various kinds of natural actions done by many of the accused, in or to their own bodies, as leaning, bending, turning awry, or squeezing their hands, or the like, were presently attended the like things, preternaturally done upon the bodies of the afflicted, though they were so far asunder that the afflicted could not at all observe the accused. Magnalia, Book 2, page 61. Indeed, throughout his account of the appearances and occurrences at the examinations before the committing magistrates, it must be allowed that he exposed a decided bias in his own mind to the belief and reception of the spectral evidence. He commences that account in these words. Some scores of people, first about Salem, the center, and first born of all the towns in the colony, and afterwards in several other places, were arrested with many preternatural vexations upon their bodies, and a variety of cruel torments, which were evidently inflicted from the demons of the invisible world. The people that were infected and infested with such demons, in a few days' time, arrived, as such a refining alteration upon their eyes, that they could see their tormentors. They saw a devil of a little stature and of a tawny color, attended still with specters that appeared in more human circumstances. Page 60. And he concludes as follows. Flashy people may burlesque these things, but when hundreds of the most sober people in a country, where they have as much mother wit certainly as the rest of mankind, know them to be true, Nothing but the absurd and forward spirit of seducium can question them. I have not yet mentioned so much as one thing that will not be justified, if it be required, by the oaths of more considerate persons than any 
that can ridicule these odd phenomena. Page 61. When he comes to the conclusion of the affair and mentions the general pardon of the convicted and accused, he says, There fell out several strange things that caused the spirit of the country to run as vehemently upon the acquitting of all the accused, as it had, by mistake, ran at first upon the condemning of them. In fine, the last courts that stayed upon this thorny business, finding that it was impossible to penetrate into the whole meaning of the things that had happened, and that so many unsearchable cheats were interwoven into the conclusion of a mysterious business, which perhaps had not crept thereinto at the beginning of it, they cleared all the accused as fast as they tried them. But even then, Mather could not wholly disengage his mind from the mistake. More than twice twenty, he says, in connection with the fact that the confessions had been receded from, had made such voluntary and harmonious and uncontrollable confessions that, if they were all sham, there was therein the greatest violation, made by the efficacy of the invisible world upon the rules of understanding human affairs, that was ever seen since God made man upon the earth. In this same work he presents, in condensed shape, the views of the advocates and of the opponents of spectral testimony, without striking the balance between them or avowedly taking sides with either. Though it may be fairly observed, that the weight he puts into the scale of the former is quite preponderating. From incidental expressions, too, it might be inferred that he was to be classed with the former, as he ascribes to them some philosophical schemes, in explanation of the phenomena of witchcraft, that look like his notion of the plastic spirit of the world. Another incidental remark seems to point to increase Mather, as to be classified with the latter, as follows. Though against some of them that were tried, there came in so much other evidence of their diabolical compacts, that some of the most judicious and yet vehement opposers of the notions then in vogue publicly declared, had they themselves been on the bench, they could not have acquitted them. Nevertheless, divers were condemned, against whom the chief evidence was founded in the spectral exhibitions. Increase Mather, in his postscript to his cases of conscience, says... I am glad that there is published to the world, by my son, abbreviate of the trials of some who were lately executed, whereby I hope the thinking part of mankind will be satisfied, that there was more than that which is called spectre evidence for the conviction of persons condemned. I was not myself present at any of the trials, excepting one, viz. of George Burroughs. Had I been one of his judges, I could not have acquitted him for several persons did upon oath testify that they saw him do such things as no man that has not a devil to be his familiar could perform. It is observable that Increase Mather does not express, nor intimate, in this passage, any objection to the introduction of spectral evidence. When we come to consider Cotton Mather's breviate of the trials of George Burroughs, we shall see how slight and inadequate was what Increase Mather could have heard at the trial to prove that Burroughs had exhibited strength which the devil could only have supplied. The most trivial and impertinent matter was all that was needed to be added to spectral testimony to give it fatal effect. The value, by the way, of Increase Mather's averment that more than that which is called specter evidence was adduced against the persons convicted is somewhat impaired by the admission of Cotton Mather just before quoted that divers were condemned, against whom it was the chief evidence. In stating the objection, by some, to the admission of spectral evidence, on the ground that the devil might assume the shape of an innocent person, and if that person was held answerable for the actions of that spectral appearance, it would be in the power of the devil to convict and destroy any number of innocent and righteous people, and thereby subvert government and disband, and ruin human society. Cotton Mather gets over the difficulty, thus. And yet God may sometimes suffer such things, to even that we may know. Thereby, how much are we beholden to him? For the restraint which he lays upon the infernal spirits, who would else reduce a world into chaos? This is a striking instance of the way in which words may be made, not only to cover but to transform ideas. A reverent form of language conceals an irreverent conception. The thought is too shocking for plain utterance, but, dressed in the garb of ingenious phraseology, 
it assumes an aspect that enables it to pass as a devout acknowledgment of divine mystery. The real meaning, absurd as it is dreadful, to state or think, is that the Heavenly Father, sometimes, may not merely permit but will the lies of the devil to mislead tribunals of justice, to the shedding of the blood of the righteous, that he may thereby show how we are beholding to him, that a like outrage and destruction does not happen to us all. He allows the devil, by false testimony, to bring about the perpetration of the most horrible wrong. It is a part of the rectorial righteousness of God that it should be so. What if the courts do admit the testimony of the devil, in the appearance of a specter, and on its strength consign to death the innocent? It is the will of God that it should be so. Let that will be done. But however the sentiment deserves to be characterized, it removes the only ground upon which, in that day, spectral evidence was objected to, namely that it might endanger the innocent. If such was the will of God, the objectors were silenced. In concluding the examination of the question whether Cotton Mather denounced or countenanced the admission of spectral testimony, for that is the issue before us, I feel confident that it has been made apparent that it was not in reference to the admission of such testimony that he objected to the principles that some of the judges had espoused, but to the method in which it should be handled and managed. I deny utterly that it can be shown that he opposed its admission. In none of his public writings did he ever pretend to this. The utmost upon which he ventured, driven to the defensive on this very point, as he was during all the rest of his days, was to say that he was opposed to its excessive use. Once indeed, in his private diary, under that self-delusion, which often led him to be blind to the import of his language, contradicting in one part what he had said in another part in the same sentence, evidently, as I believe, without any conscious and intentional violation of the truth, he makes this statement. For my own part, I was always afraid of proceeding to convict and condemn any person as a confederate with afflicting demons, upon so feeble an evidence as spectral representation. Accordingly, I ever protested against it, both publicly and privately, and, in my latter to the judges, I particularly besought them that they would by no means admit it. And when a considerable assembly of ministers gave in their advice about that matter, I not only concurred with them, but it was I who drew it up. This shows how he indulged himself in forms of expression that misled him. His letter to the judges means, I suppose, that written to Richards, and he had so accustomed his mind to the attempt to make the advice of the ministers bear this construction as to deceive himself. The document does not say a word, much less protest against the admission of that evidence. It was not designed, and was not understood by any at that time, to have that bearing, but only to urge suggestions of caution in its use and management. Charity to him requires us to receive his declaration in the diary as subject to the modifications he himself connects with it, and to mean no more than we find expressed in the letter to Richards and in the advice but if he really had deluded himself into the idea that he had protested against the admission of spectral evidence, he has not succeeded, probably in deluding any other persons than his son Samuel, who repeated the language of the diary and our reviewer. The question I finally repeat is as to the admission of that species of evidence at all, in any stage, in any form, to any extent. Cotton Mather never, in any public writing, denounced the admission of it never advised its absolute exclusion, but on the contrary, recognized it as grounds of presumption. Increase Mather stated that the devil's accusations, which he considered spectral evidence really to be, may be so far regarded as to cause an inquiry into the truth of things. These are the facts of history, and not to be moved from their foundation in the public record of that day. There is no reason to doubt that all the ministers in the early stages of the delusion concurred in these views, all partook of the awe mentioned by Mather, which filled the minds of the juries, judges, and the people whenever this kind of testimony was introduced. No matter how nor when, whether as presumption to build other evidence upon, 
or as a cause for further inquiry, nothing could stand against it. Character, reason, common sense were swept away. As long as it was suffered to come in, anyhow, or to be credited at all, the horrid fanaticism and its horrible consequences continued. When it was wholly excluded, the reign of terror and of death ceased. End of chapters 1 and 8 from Salem Witchcraft and Cotton Mather by Charles W. Upham Read by Tory B. Summary of Science, The Endless Frontier by Venever Bush. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Summary of Science, The Endless Frontier by Venever Bush. Scientific progress is essential. Progress in the war against disease depends upon a flow of new scientific knowledge. New products, new industries, and more jobs require continuous additions to knowledge of the laws of nature and the application of that knowledge to practical purposes. Similarly, our defense against aggression demands new knowledge so that we can develop new and improved weapons. This essential new knowledge can be obtained only through basic scientific research. Science can be effective in the national welfare only as a member of a team, whether the conditions be war or peace. But without scientific progress, no amount of achievement in other directions can ensure our health, prosperity, and security as a nation in the modern world. For the war against disease, we have taken great strides in the war against disease. The death rate for all diseases in the Army, including overseas forces, has been reduced from 14.1 per thousand in the last war to 0 0.6 per thousand in this war. In the last 40 years, life expectancy has increased from 49 to 65 years, largely as a consequence of the reduction in the death rates of infants and children. But we are far from the goal. The annual death rates from one or two diseases far exceed the total number of American lives lost in battle during this war. A large fraction of these deaths in our civilian population cut short the useful lives of our citizens. Approximately 7 million persons in the United States are mentally ill, and their care costs the public over $175 million a year. Clearly, much illness remains, for which adequate means of prevention and cure are not yet known. The responsibility for basic research in medicine and the underlying sciences so essential to progress in the war against disease falls primarily upon the medical schools and universities. Yet we find that the traditional sources of support for medical research in the medical schools and universities, largely endowment income, foundation grants, and private donations, are diminishing, and there is no immediate prospect for a change in this trend. Meanwhile, the cost of medical research has been rising. If we are to maintain the progress in medicine which has marked the last 25 years, the government should extend financial support to basic medical research in the medical schools and in universities. For our national security, the bitter and dangerous battle against the U-boat was a battle of scientific techniques, and our margin of success was dangerously small. The new eyes which radar has supplied can sometimes be blinded by new scientific developments. V-2 was countered only by capture of the launching sites. We cannot again rely on our allies to hold off the enemy while we struggle to catch up. There must be more, and more adequate, military research in peacetime. It is essential that the civilian scientists continue in peacetime some portion of those contributions to national security which they have made so effectively during the war. This can be best done through a civilian-controlled organization with close liaison with the Army and Navy, but with funds direct from Congress, and the clear power to initiate military research which will supplement and strengthen that carried out directly under the control of the Army and Navy. And for the public welfare. One of our hopes is that after the war there will be full employment. To reach that goal, the full creative and productive energies of the American people must be released. To create more jobs, we must make new and better and cheaper products. We want plenty of new, vigorous enterprises. But new products and processes are not born full-grown. They are founded on new principles and new conceptions, which in turn result from basic scientific research. Basic scientific research is scientific capital. Moreover, we cannot any longer depend upon Europe as a major source of this scientific capital. 
Clearly, more and better scientific research is one essential to the achievement of our goal of full employment. How do we increase this scientific capital? First, we must have plenty of men and women trained in science, for upon them depends both the creation of new knowledge and its application to practical purposes. Second, we must strengthen the centers of basic research, which are principally the colleges, universities, and research institutes. These institutes provide the environment which is most conducive to the creation of new scientific knowledge, and at least under pressure for immediate tangible results. With some notable exceptions, most research in industry and government involves application of existing scientific knowledge to practical problems. It is only the colleges, universities, and a few research institutes that devote most of their research efforts to expanding the frontiers of knowledge. Expenditures for scientific research by industry and government increased from $140 million in 1930 to $309 million in 1940. Those for the colleges and universities increased from $20 million to $31 million, while those for research institutes declined from $5.2 million to $4.5 million during the same period. If the colleges, universities, and research institutes are to meet the rapidly increasing demands of industry and government for new scientific knowledge, their basic research should be strengthened by use of public funds. For science to serve as a powerful factor in our national welfare, applied research both in government and in industry must be vigorous. To improve the quality of scientific research within the government, steps should be taken to modify the procedures for recruiting, classifying, and compensating scientific personnel in order to reduce the present handicap of governmental scientific bureaus in competing with industry and the universities for top-grade scientific talent. To provide coordination of the common scientific activities of these governmental agencies as to policies and budgets, a permanent science advisory board should be created to advise the executive and legislative branches of government on these matters. The most important ways in which the government can promote industrial research are to increase the flow of new scientific knowledge through support of basic research and to aid in the development of scientific talent. In addition, the government should provide suitable incentives to an industry to conduct research. A. By clarification of present uncertainties in the Internal Revenue Code in regard to the deductibility of research and development expenditures as current charges against net income. And B. By strengthening the patent system so as to eliminate uncertainties which now bear heavily on small industries, and so as to prevent abuses which reflect discredit upon a basically sound system. In addition, ways should be found to cause the benefits of basic research to reach industries which do not now utilize new scientific knowledge. We must renew our scientific talent. The responsibility for the creation of new scientific knowledge, and for most of its application, rests on the small body of men and women who understand the fundamental laws of nature and are skilled in the techniques of scientific research. We shall have rapid or slow advance on any scientific frontier depending on the number of highly qualified and trained scientists exploring it. The deficit of science and technology students who, but for the war, would have received bachelor's degrees is about 150,000. It is estimated that the deficit of those obtaining advanced degrees in these fields will amount in 1955 to about 17,000, for it takes at least six years from college entry to achieve a doctor's degree, or its equivalent in science or engineering. The real ceiling on our productivity of new scientific knowledge and its application in the war against disease and the development of new products and in new industries is the number of trained scientists available. The training of a scientist is a long and expensive process. Studies clearly show that there are talented individuals in every part of the population, but with few exceptions, those without the means of buying higher education go without it. If ability, and not the circumstance of family fortune, determines who shall receive higher education in science, then we shall be assured of constantly improving quality at every level of scientific activity. The government should provide a reasonable number of undergraduate scholarships and graduate fellowships in order to develop scientific talent in America's youth. The plans should be designed to attract into science only that proportion of youthful talent appropriate to the needs of science in relation to the other needs of the nation for high abilities, including those in uniform. 
the most immediate prospect of making up the deficit in scientific personnel is to develop the scientific talent in the generation now in uniform. Even if we should start now to train the current crop of high school graduates, none would complete graduate studies before 1951. The armed services should comb their records for men who, prior to or during the war, have given evidence of talent for science and make prompt arrangements consistent with current discharge plans for ordering those who remain in uniform as soon as militarily possible to duty at institutions here and overseas where they can continue their scientific education. Moreover, the services should see that those who study overseas have the benefit of the latest scientific information resulting from research during the war. The lid must be lifted. While most of the war research has involved the application of existing scientific knowledge to the problems of war, rather than basic research, there has been accumulated a vast amount of information related to the application of science to particular problems. Much of this can be used by industry. It is also needed for teaching in the colleges and universities here and in the armed forces institutes overseas. Some of this information must remain secret, but most of it should be made public as soon as there is ground for belief that the enemy will not be able to turn it against us in this war. To select that portion which should be made public, to coordinate its release, and definitely to encourage its publication, a board composed of Army, Navy, and civilian scientific members should be promptly established. A Program for Action the government should accept new responsibilities for promoting the flow of new scientific knowledge and the development of scientific talent in our youth. These responsibilities are the proper concern of the government, for they vitally affect our health, our jobs, and our national security. It is in keeping also with basic United States policy that the government should foster the opening of new frontiers, and this is the modern way to do it. For many years, the government has wisely supported research in the agricultural colleges, and the benefits have been great. The time has come when such support should be extended to other fields. The effective discharge of these new responsibilities will require full attention of some overall agency devoted to that purpose. There is not now in the permanent governmental structure receiving its funds from Congress an agency adapted to supplementing the support of basic research in the colleges, universities, and research institutes, both in medicine and the natural sciences adapted to supporting research on new weapons for both services, or adapted to administering a program of science, scholarships, and fellowships. Therefore, I recommend that a new agency for these purposes be established. Such an agency should be composed of persons of broad interest and experience, having an understanding of the peculiarities of scientific research and scientific education. It should have stability of funds so that long-range programs may be undertaken. It should recognize that freedom of inquiry must be preserved and should leave internal control of policy, personnel, and the method and scope of research to the institutes in which it is carried on. It should be fully responsible to the President and through him to the Congress for its program. Early action on these recommendations is imperative if this nation is to meet the challenge of science in the crucial years ahead. On the wisdom with which we bring science to bear in the war against disease, in the creation of new industries, and in the strengthening of our armed forces, depends in large measure our future as a nation. End of Summary of Science, The Endless Frontier by Vannevar Bush Read by Neil Solson Superstitions of Witchcraft, Chapter 4, by Howard Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4. Astrology in Antiquity. Modern Astrology and Alchemy. Toralvo. Adventures of Dr. D. and Edward Kelly. Prospero and Calmus types respectively of the theurgic and goetic arts, magicians on the stage in the 16th century, occult science, and southern Europe, causes of the inevitable mistakes of the pre-scientific ages. The nobler arts of magic, astrology, alchemy, necromancy, etc., were equally in vogue in this age with that of the infernal proper, but they were more respected. Professors of those arts were habitually sought for with great eagerness by the highest personages, and often munificently rewarded. In antiquity, 
Astrology had been peculiarly oriental in its origin and practice. The Egyptians, and especially the Chaldeans, introduced the foreign art to the West among the Greeks and Italians. The Arabs revived it in Western Europe in the Middle Age. Under the early Roman Empire, the Chaldaic art exercised and enjoyed considerable influence and reputation, if it was often subject to sudden persecutions. Augustus was assisted to the throne, and Severus selected his wife by its means. After it had once firmly established itself in the West, the Oriental astrology was soon developed and reduced to a more regular system, and in the 16th and 17th centuries, Dee and Lily enjoyed a greater reputation than even Figulus or Thrasyllus had obtained in the first century. Queen Elizabeth and Catherine de' Medici, two of the astutest persons of their age, patronized them. Dr. Dee in England and Nostradamus in France were of this class. Dr. Caius, third founder of the college still bearing his name in the University of Cambridge, Kelly, Ashmole, and Lilly, are well-known names. In the astrological history of this period, Toralvo, whose fame as an aerial voyager is immortalized by Cervantes and Don Quixote, was a great magician in Spain and Italy, as D in England, although not so familiar to English readers as their countryman, the protege of Elizabeth. Neither was his magical faculty so well rewarded. Dr. Toralvo, a physician, had studied medicine and philosophy with extraordinary success, and was high in the confidence of many of the eminent personages of Spain and Italy, for whom he fortunately predicted future success. A confirmed infidel or free thinker, he was denounced to the Inquisition by the treachery of an associate as denying or disputing the immortality of the soul as well as the divinity of Christ. This was 1529. Toralvo, put to the torture, admitted that his informing spirit, Zekiel, was a demon by whose assistance he performed his aerial journeys and all his extraordinary feats, both of prophecy and of actual power. Some part of the severity of the tortures was remitted by the demon's opportune reply to the curiosity of the presiding inquisitors that Luther and the reforms were bad and cunning men. Toralvo seemed to have avoided the extreme penalty of fire by recanting his heresies, submitting to the superior judgment of his jailers, and still more by the interest of his powerful employers, and he was liberated not long afterwards. The diffusion and progress of astrology in the last two centuries before the empire in Greece and Italy was favored chiefly by the four following causes, its resemblance to the meteorological astrology of the Greeks, the belief in the conversion of the souls of men into stars, the cessation of the oracles, the belief in the tutelary genius. Sir G. C. Lewis's Historical Survey of the Astronomy of the Ancients, Chapter 5. The life of Dr. D., an eminent Cambridge mathematician, and of his associate Edward Kelly, forms a curious biography. D. was born in 1527. He studied at the English and foreign universities with great success and applause. And while the Princess Elizabeth was quite young, he acquired her friendship, maintained by frequent correspondence, and on her succession to the throne, the Queen showed her goodwill in a conspicuous manner. John Dee left to posterity a diary in which he has inserted a regular account of his conjurations, prophetic intimations, and magical resources. Notwithstanding his mathematical acumen, he was the dupe of his cunning subordinate, more of a knave, probably, than his master. In 1583, a Polish prince, Albert Lasky, visiting the English court, frequented the society of the renowned astrologer, by whom he was initiated in the secrets of the art, and predicted to be the future means of an important revolution in Europe. The astrologers wandered over all Germany, and at one time favorably received by the credulity, at another time ignominiously rejected by the indignant despondent of a patron. Dee returned to England in 1589, and was finally appointed to the wardenship of the college at Manchester. In James's reign, he was well received at court, his reputation as a magician increasing, and in 1604, he is found presenting a petition to the king, imploring his good offices in dispelling the injurious imputation of being a conjurer, or caller, or invocator of devils. Lily, the most celebrated magician of the 17th century in England, 
was in the highest repute during the civil wars. His prophetic services were sought with equal anxiety by royalist and patriots, by king and parliament. Sometimes the professor of the occult science may have been his own dupe. Oftener he imposed and speculated upon the credulity of others. While traveling in Bohemia on a particular occasion, it was revealed to be God's pleasure that the two friends should have a community of wives. A little episode noted in Dee's journal. On Sunday, May 3rd, 1587, I, John D., Edward Kelly, and our two wives covenanted with God and subscribed the same for indissoluble unities, charity, and friendship, keeping between us four, and all things between us to be common, as God by sundry means willed us to do. A sort of inspiration of frequent occurrence in religious revelations from the times of the Arabian to those of the American prophet. William Lilly wrote a history of his own life and times, his adroitness in accommodating his prophecies to the alternating chances of the war does him a considerable credit as prophet. Prospero is the type of the theurgic, as Comus is of the goetic magician. His spiritual minister belongs to the order of good, or at least middle spirits. Too black for heaven, yet too white for hell. Released by his new lord from the soteric spell of the damned witch, Sycorax, he comes gratefully, if somewhat weariedly, to answer this, Bless pleasure, be it to fly, to swim, to dive into the fire, to ride into the curled clouds, etc. Prospero, by an irresistible magic, subdued to his service the reluctant Caliban, a monster got by the devil himself upon his wicked dam. But that semi-demon is degraded into a mere beast of burden, brutal and savage, with little of the spiritual essence of his male parent. Camus, as represented in that most beautiful drama by the genius of Milton, is of the classic rather than the Christian sort. He is the true son of Circe, using his mother's method of enchantment, transforming his unwary victims into the various forms or faces of the bestial herd, like the island magician without his magical garment, the wicked enchanter without his wand, loses his soretic power, and, without his rod reversed, and backward mutters of disserting power. It is not possible to disenchant his spellbound prisoners. In the 16th century, many wonderful stories obtained of the tremendous feats of the magic art. Those that related to the lives of Bacon and of Faust of German origin were best known in England, and, in the dramatic form, were represented on the stage. The comedy of Friar Bacon and Friar Banguet and the tragedy of the life and death of Dr. Faustus are perhaps the most esteemed of the dramatic writings of the age which preceded the appearance of Shakespeare. In the latter, Faustus makes a compact with the devil, by which a familiar spirit and a preternatural art are granted him for twenty-four years. At the end of this period, his soul is to be the reward of the demons. From the Faustus of Christopher Marlowe, Goethe has derived the name and idea of the most celebrated tragedy of our day. Conscious of his approaching fate, the trembling magician replies to the ancient inquiries of his surrounding pupils. For the vain pleasure of four and twenty years hath Faustus lost eternal joy and felicity. I writ them a bill with my own blood. The date is expired. This is the time, and he will fetch me. First scholar, why did not Faustus tell us of this before, that the divines might have prayed for thee? Faust. Oft have I thought to have done so, but the devil threatened to tear me to pieces if I named God, to fetch my body and soul if I once gave ear to divinity, and now it is too late. As the fearful moment fast approaches, Dr. Faustus, orthodox on the subject of the duration of future punishment, exclaims in agony, Oh, if my soul must suffer for my sin, impose some end to my incessant pain. Let Faustus live in hell a thousand years, a hundred thousand and at last be saved. No end is limited to damned souls. Why weren't thou not a creature wanting soul? Oh, why is this immortal that thou hast? Etc. Mephistopheles, it need hardly be added, was on the occasion true to his reputation for punctuality. Friar Bacon and Friar Bungay is remarked for being one of the last dramatic pieces in which the devil appears on the stage in his proper person. 1591. It is also noticeable that he is 
the only scripture character in the new form of the play retained from the miracles which delighted the spectators in the fifteenth century, who were at once edified and gratified by the corporal chastisement inflicted upon his vicarious back. Magic and necromantic prowess was equally recognized in southern Europe. The Italian poets employed such imposing paraphernalia in the construction of an epic, and Cervantes has ridiculed the prevailing belief of his countrymen. Benventuno Cellini, the Florentine engraver, in his amusing autobiography, astonishes his readers with some necromantic wonders of which he was an eyewitness. Cellini had become acquainted and enamored with a beautiful Sicilian, from whom he was suddenly separated. He tells, with his accustomed candor and confidence, I was then indulging myself in pleasures of all sorts and engaged in another amour to cancel the memory of my Sicilian mistress. It happened, through a variety of odd accidents, that I made my acquaintance with a Sicilian priest, who was a man of genius and well-versed in the Latin and Greek authors, happening one day to have some conversation with him upon the art of necromancy. I, who had a great desire to know something of the matter, told him I had all my life felt a curiosity to be acquainted with the mysteries of this art. The priest made answer, that the man must be of a resolute and steady temper who enters upon that study, and so it should seem from the event. One night, Cellini, with a companion familiar with the black art, attended the priest to the Colosseum, where the latter, according to the custom of necromancy, began to draw marks upon the ground, with the most impressive ceremonies imaginable, and likewise brought thither asafetida, several precious perfumes, and fire with some compositions which disfused noisome odors. Although several legions of devils obeyed the summons of the conjurations or compositions, the sorceric rites were not attended with complete success. But on the succeeding night, the necromancer, having begun to make his tremendous invocations, called by their names a multitude of demons, who were the leaders of the several legions, and invoked them by the virtue and power of the eternal, uncreated God who lives forever, insomuch that the amphitheater was almost in an instant filled with demons a hundred times more numerous than the former conjuration. I, by the direction of the necromancer, again desired to be in the company of my Angelica. The former, thereupon, turning to me, said, Know that they have declared that in the space of a month you shall be in her company. Then he requested me to stand resolutely by him, because the legion were now above a thousand more in number than he had designed, and besides, these were the most dangerous, so that after they had answered my question, it behooved him to be civil to them and dismiss them quietly. The infernal legions were more easily invoked than dismissed, he proceeds. Though I was as much terrified as any of them, I did my utmost to conceal the terror I felt, so that I greatly contributed to inspire the rest with resolution. But the truth is ingenuously confesses the armorist artist i gave myself over for a dead man seeing the horrid fright the necromancer was in autobiography of benvenuto cellini chapter thirteen roscoe's translation the information was verified and benventuno enjoyed the society of his mistress at the time foretold alchemy the science of the transformation of baser metals into gold a pursuit which engaged the anxious thought and wasted the health time and fortunes of numbers of fanatical empirics was one of the most prized of the abstruse occult arts monarchs princes the great of all countries eagerly vied among themselves in encouraging with promises and sometimes with more substantial incentives the zeal of their elusive search and henry the fourth of france could see no reason why if the bread and wine were transubstantiated so miraculously, a metal could not be transformed as well. The class of horoscopists, the old Chaldeic genethalics, or those who predicted the fortunes of individuals by an examination of the planets, which presided at the natal hour, was as much in vogue as that of any other of the masters of the occult arts. And La Fontaine, towards the end of the 17th century, apostrophizes the class. Charlotte, Fazu de Horscope, Chitele Cor de Prince de Europe, Amene avec voulez souffleur, Tudontum, vous ne meritez pas plus de foi. 
Fables 2.13. But it is only necessary to recollect the name of Cagliostro, Balsamo, and others who, in the 18th century, could successfully speculate upon the credulity of people of rank and education, to moderate our wonder at the success of earlier empirics. Among the eminent names of self-styled or reputed masters of the nobler or white magic, some, like the celebrated Periclesis, were men of extraordinary attainments and largely acquired with the secrets of natural science, a necessarily imperfect knowledge, a natural desire to impose upon the ignorant wonder of the vulgar, and the vanity of a learning which was ambitious of exhibiting in the most imposing if less intelligible way. Their superior knowledge were probably the mixed causes which led such distinguished scholars as Periclesis, Cornelius, Agrippa, Cardan, and Campanella to oppress themselves and their readers with a mass of unintelligible rubbish and cabalistic mysticism. Slow and gradual as are the successive advances in the knowledge and improvement of mankind, it would not be reasonable to be surprised that preceding generations could not at once attain to the knowledge of the maturer age, and the teachers of mankind groped their dark in a certain way in ages destitute of the illumination of modern times. Cardin believed great states depend upon the tip of the bear's tail's end, correctly enough expresses both the persuasion of the public and that of many of the soi distant philosophers of the intimate dependence of the fates of both states and individuals of the globe upon other globes in the universe. It was not so much a want of sufficient observation of known facts as the want of a true method and of verification which rendered the investigations of the earlier philosophers so vague and uncertain, and the same cause which necessarily prevented Aristotle, the greatest intellect, perhaps, that has ever illuminated the world, from attaining to the greater perfection of the modern philosophy, are applicable in a greater degree in the case of the medieval and later discoverers. The causes of the failure of the pre-scientific world are well stated by a living writer, Men cannot, or at least they will not, await the tardy result of discovery. They will not sit down in avowed ignorance. Imagination supplies the deficiencies of observation. A theoretic arch is thrown across the chasm, because men are unwilling to wait till a solid bridge be constructed. The early thinkers, by reason of the very splendor of their capacities, were not less incompetent to follow the slow process of scientific investigation than a tribe of martial savages to adopt a strategy and discipline of modern armies. No accumulated laws, no well-tried methods existed for their aid. The elementary laws in each department were mostly undetected. The guide of knowledge is verification. The complexity of phenomena is that of a labyrinth, the paths of which cross and recross each other. One wrong turn causes the wanderer infinite perplexity. Verification is the aredne thread by which the real issues may be found. Unhappily, the process of verification is slow, tedious, often difficult, and deceptive. And we are by nature lazy and impatient, hating labor, eager to obtain, hence credulity. We accept facts without scrutiny inductions without proof, and we yield to our disposition to believe that the order of phenomena must correspond with our conceptions. A profound truth is contained in the assertion of corps de philosophie positive, that men have still more need of method than of doctrine, of education than of instruction. Aristotle by G. H. Lewis End of Superstitions of Witchcraft Chapter 4 by Howard Williams, read by Tori B. Sweet Seventeen, from The Girl of the Period and Other Social Essays, by E. Lynn Linton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sweet Seventeen. A vast amount of poetry has always been thrown round that special time of a woman's life when 
standing with reluctant feet where the brook and river meet she is no longer a child and yet not quite a woman that transition time between the closed bud and the full-blown flower which we in england express by the term among others of sweet seventeen without meaning to be sentimental or to envelop things in a golden haze wrought by the imagination only and nowhere to be found in fact we cannot deny the peculiar charm which belongs to a girl of this age if she is nice and neither pert nor silly besides it is not only what she is that interests us but what she will be for this is the time when the character is settling into its permanent form so that the great thought of every one connected with her is how will she turn out into what kind of woman will the girl develop and what kind of life will she make for herself certainly sweet seventeen may be a most unlovely creature and in fact she often is a creature hard and forward having lost the innocence and obedience of childhood and having gained nothing yet of the tact and grace of womanhood a creature whose hopes and thoughts are all centred on the time when she shall be brought out and have her fling of flirting and fine dresses with the rest or she may be only a gauche and giggling schoolgirl with a mind as narrow as her life given up to the small intrigues and scandals of the dormitory and the playground a girl who scams her lessons and cheats her masters whose highest efforts of intellect are shown in the cleverness with which she can break the rules of the establishment without being found out who thinks talking at forbidden times peeping through forbidden windows giving silly nicknames to her companions and teachers and telling silly secrets with less truth than ingenuity in them the greatest fun imaginable and all the greater because of the spice of rebellion and perversity with which her folly is dashed or she may be a mere tomboy regretting her sex and despising its restraints cultivating schoolboy slang and aping schoolboy habits ridiculing her sisters and disliked by her companions while thinking girlhood a bore and womanhood a mistake in exact proportion to its feminality or she may be a budding miss shy and awkward with no harm in her and as little good a mere sketch of a girl without a leading line as yet made out or the dominant colour so much as indicated sometimes she is awkward in another way being studious and preoccupied when she passes for odd and original and is partly feared partly disliked and wholly misunderstood by her own young world and sometimes she has a cynical contempt for men and beauty and pleasure and dress when she will make herself ridiculous by her revolt against all the canons of good taste and conventionality but after her debut in tattered garments of severe colours and ungainly cut she will probably end her days as a frantic fashionable the salvation of whose soul depends on the faultless propriety of her wardrobe the eccentricities of sweet seventeen not unfrequently revenge themselves by an exactly opposite extravagance of maturity but though there are enough and to spare of girls according to all these patterns the sweet seventeen of one's affections is none of them and yet she is not always the same but has her different presentations her varying facets which give her variety of charm and beauty the best and loveliest thing about sweet seventeen is her sense of duty for the most part a new sense she no longer needs to be told what to do she has not to be kept to her tasks by the fear of authority nor the submissive grace of obedience but of her own free will because understanding that it is her duty and that duty is a holier thing than self-will she conscientiously does what she does not like to do and cheerfully gives up what she desires without being driven or exhorted she has generally before her mind some favourite heroine in a girl's novel who goes through much painful discipline and comes out all the brighter for it in the end and she makes noble resolves of living as worthily as her model she comforts her soul too with passages from longfellow and tennyson and the christian year 
and learns long extracts from Evangeline and the Idols, poetry having an almost magical influence over her, nearly as powerful as the Sunday sermons to which she listens so devoutly and tries so patiently to understand. For the first time she wakes to a dim sense of her own individuality and confesses to herself that she has a life of her own, apart from and extraneous to her mere family membership. She is not only the sister or the daughter living with and for her parents or her brothers and sisters, but she is also herself, with a future of her own not to be shared with them, not to be touched by them. And she begins to have vague dreams of this future and its hero, dreams that are as much a fairyland as if they were of the young prince coming over the sea in a golden boat to find the princess in a tower of brass waiting for him. Quite impersonal, and with a hero only in the clouds, nevertheless these dreams are suggested by the special circumstances of her life, by her favorite books, or the style of society in which she has been placed. The young prince is either a beautiful and high-souled clergyman, not unlike the young vicar or the new curate, but infinitely more beautiful, an apostle in the standing collar and single-breasted coat of the nineteenth century, or he is an artist in a velvet blouse and with flowing hair, living in a world of beauty such as no Philistine can imagine, or he is a gallant sailor with blue eyes and a loose necktie, looking up to heaven in a gale and thinking of his mother and sisters at home and of the one still more beloved, when he certainly ought to be thinking of tarry robes and coarse sailcloth. Or he is a magnificent young officer heading his men at a charge and looking supremely well got up and handsome. This is the kind of futur she dreams of when she dreams at all, which is not often. The reality of her mature life is perhaps a stolid square-set squire or a prosaic city merchant without the thinnest thread of romance in his composition, while her own life, which was to be such a lovely poem of graceful usefulness and heroic beauty, sinks into the prosaic routine of housekeeping and society, the sigh after the vanished ideal growing fainter and fainter as the weight of fact grows heavier. Married men are all sacred to sweet seventeen when she is a good girl, so are engaged men. For the matter of that, she believes that nothing could induce her to marry either a widower or one who had been already engaged, as nothing could induce her to marry any man under five foot eleven, or with a snub nose or sandy whiskers. Sweet seventeen has in general the most profound aversion for boys. To be sure, she may have her favourites, very few and very seldom, but she mostly thinks them stupid or conceited, and impartially resents either their awkward attentions to herself or their assumptions of superiority. An abnormally clever boy, the poet laureate or George Stevenson of his generation, is her detestation because he is odd and unlike everyone else while the one that she dislikes least among them is the school hero who is first in the sports and takes all the prizes, and who goes through life loved by everyone and never famous. For her several brothers she has a range of entirely different feelings. Her younger schoolboy brothers she regards as the torments of her existence, whose unkempt hair, dirty boots, and rude manners are her special crosses to be borne with patience, tempered by an active endeavour after reform. But the more advanced, and those who are older than herself, are her loves for whom she has an enthusiastic admiration, and whose future she believes in as something specially brilliant and successful. If only slightly older or younger than herself, she impresses them powerfully with a sentiment of her superiority, and patronizes them, kindly enough but she makes them feel the ineffable supremacy of her sex, and how that she, by virtue of her womanhood, is a glorified creature beside them, an Ariel to their Caliban. Now, too, she begins to speak to her mother on more equal terms, to criticize her dress and to make her understand that she considers her old-fashioned and inclined to be dowdy. She ties her bonnet strings for her, arranges her cap, smartens up her old dress and compels her to buy a new one, and, while considering her immeasurably ancient, 
likes her to look nice, and thinks her in her own way beautiful. Sometimes she opposes and quarrels with her, if the mother has less tact than arbitrariness. But this is not her natural state, for one of the characteristics of Sweet Seventeen is her love for her mother and her need of better counsel and guidance, so that if she comes into opposition with her, it is only through extreme pain and the bitter teaching of tyranny and injustice. This is just the age indeed when the mother's influence is everything to a girl, and when a silly, an unjust, or an unprincipled woman is the very ruin of her life. But with a low or evil-natured mother, we seldom see a sweet seventeen worth the trouble of writing about, which shows at least one thing, the importance of the womanly influence at such a time, and how so much that we blame in our modern girls lies to the account of their mothers. Great tact is required with sweet seventeen in such society as is allowed her, care to bring her out a little without obtruding her on the world, without making her forward and consequential, and without attracting too much attention to her. She is no longer a child to be shut away in the nursery, but she is not yet entitled to the place and consideration of a member of society, and yet it would be cruel to debar her wholly from all that is going on in the house. To be sure, there is the governess, as well as mamma, to look after her manners and to give her rope enough and not too much. But by the time a girl is seventeen, a governess has ceased to be the autocrat ex officio, and she obeys her, or not, according to their respective strengths. Still the governess, or mamma, is for the most part at her elbow, and sweet seventeen, if well brought up, is left very little to her own guidance, and sees the world only through half-opened doors. Girls of this age are often wonderfully sad, and full of a kind of wandering despair at the sin and misery they are beginning to learn. They take up extreme views in religion, and talk largely on the nothingness of pleasure and the emptiness of the world, and many fair young creatures whom their elders, laden with sorrowful experience, think full of hope and joy, are ready to give up all the pleasure of life, and to lay down life itself for very disgust of that of which they know nothing. They delight in sorrowful lamentations and sentimental regrets put into rhyme, and one of the funniest things in the world is to see a girl dancing with the merriest in the evening, and to hear her talking broken-hearted pessimism in the morning. It is merely an example of the old proverb about the meeting of extremes, vacuity leading to the same results as experience. But however she takes this unknown life, it is always in an unreal and romantic aspect. Some of more robust mind delight in the bolder stories of Greece and Rome, and wish they had played a part in the sensational heroism of those grand old times while others go to Venice and make pictures for themselves out of the gliding gondolas and the mysterious Council of Ten, the lovely ladies with grim old fathers and high-handed brothers acting as jailers, and the handsome cavaliers serenading them in the moonlight. That is their idea of love. They have no perception of anything warmer. It is all romance and poetry and tender glances from afar and long and patient wooing under difficulties and a little danger with scarce a word spoken and nothing more expressive than a flower furtively given or a fleeting pressure of the fingertips. They know nothing else and expect nothing else. Their cherry is without stone, their bird without bone, their orange without rind as in the old song and they imagine a love as unreal as all the rest. When thrown into actualities, though, say, when left motherless, and the eldest girl of perhaps a large family with a father to comfort and a young brood to see after, sweet seventeen is often very beautiful in her degree, and rises grandly to her position. Sometimes the burden of her responsibilities is too much for her tender shoulders, and she is overweighted and fails. Sometimes, too, she is tyrannical and selfish in such a position, and uses her power ill, and sometimes she is careless and good-humoured, when they all scramble up together, through confusion, dirt, and disorder, till the close time is over, and they scatter themselves abroad. Sometimes she is a martyr, 
and makes herself and everyone else uncomfortable by the perpetual demonstration of her martyrdom, and how she considers herself sacrificed and put upon. Indeed, she is not unfrequently a martyr from other causes than heavy duties, being fond of adopting unworkable views which cannot run in the family groove anyhow. If she falls upon this rock, she is in her glory, youth being marvellously proud of voluntary crucifixion, and thinking itself especially ill-used because it must be made conformable and is prevented from making itself ridiculous. But sweet seventeen is intolerant of all moral differences. What she holds to be right is the absolute, the one sole and only just law, and she thinks it tampering with sin to allow that anyone else has an equal right with herself to a contrary opinion. But on the whole, she is a pleasant, lovable, interesting creature, and one's greatest regret about her is that she is so often in the hands of unsuitable guides, and that her powers and noble impulses get so stunted and shadowed by the commonplace training which is her general lot, and the low aims of life which are the only ones held out to her. End of Sweet Seventeen The Urine Dance of the Zuni Indians of New Mexico by Captain John G. Bork, 3rd Cavalry, U.S. Army. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the evening of November 17, 1881, during my stay in the village of Zuni, New Mexico, then the Huey Kiwi, one of secret orders of the Zunis, sent word to Mr. F. Cushing, whose guest I was, that they would do us the unusual honor of coming to our house to give us one of their characteristic dances, which, Cushing said, was unprecedented. The squaws of the governor's family put the long living room to rights, sweeping the floor and sprinkling it with water to lay the dust. Soon after dark the dancers entered. They were twelve in number, two being boys. The center men were naked with the exception of black breechcloths of archaic style. The hair was worn naturally with a bunch of wild turkey feathers tied in front, and one of corn husks over each ear. White bands were painted across the face at eyes and mouth. Each wore a collar or neckcloth of black woolen stuff. Broad white bands, one inch wide, were painted around the body at the navel, around the arms, the legs at mid-thighs and knees. Tortoiseshell rattles hung from the right knee. Blue woolen footless leggings were worn with low-cut moccasins, and in the right hand each waved a wand made of an ear of corn, trimmed with the plumage of the wild turkey and macaw. The others were arrayed in old cast-off American army clothing, and all wore white cotton nightcaps, with corn husks twisted into the hair at top of head and ears. Several wore, in addition to the tortoiseshell rattles, strings of brass sleigh-bells at knees. One was more grotesquely attired than the rest in a long, india-rubber gossamer overall and a pair of goggles, painted white, over his eyes. His general get-up was a spirited take-off upon a Mexican priest. Another was a very good counterfeit of a young woman. To the accompaniment of an oblong drum, and of the rattles and bells spoken of, they shuffled into the long room, crammed with spectators of both sexes, and of all sizes and ages. Their song was apparently a ludicrous reference to everything and everybody in sight, Cushing, Mendeleff, and myself receiving special attention, to the uncontrolled merriment of the red-skinned listeners. I had taken my station at one side of the room, seated upon the banquette, and having in front of me a rude bench or table, upon which was a small coal-oil lamp. I suppose that in the halo diffused by the feeble light, and in my stained-glass attitude, I must have borne some resemblance to the pictures of saints hanging upon the walls of old Mexican churches. To such a fancied resemblance I at least attribute the performance which followed. The dancers suddenly wheeled into line threw themselves on their knees before my table, and with extravagant beatings of breast began an outlandish but faithful mockery of a Mexican Catholic congregation at Vespers. One bawled out a parody upon the Pater Noster, 
another mumbled along in the manner of an old man reciting the rosary while the fellow with the india rubber coat jumped up and began a passionate exhortation or sermon which for mimetic fidelity was inimitable this kept the audience laughing with sore sides for some moments until at a signal from the leader the dancers suddenly countermarched out of the room in single file as they had entered an interlude followed of ten minutes during which the dusty floor was sprinkled by men who spat water forcibly from their mouths then the huey kewick re-entered this time two of their number were stark naked their singing was very peculiar and sounded like a chorus of chimney sweeps and their dance became a stiff-legged jump with heels kept twelve inches apart after they had ambled around the room two or three times cushing announced in the zuni language that a feast was ready for them at which they loudly roared their approbation and advanced to strike hands with the munificent americanos addressing us in a funny gibberish of broken spanish english and zuni they then squatted upon the ground and consumed with zest large ollas full of tea and dishes of hard tack and sugar as they were about finishing this a squaw entered carrying an olla of urine of which the filthy brutes drank heartily i refused to believe the evidence of my senses and asked cushing if that were really human urine why certainly he replied and here comes more of it this time it was a large tin pailful not less than two gallons i was standing by the squaw as she offered this strange and abominable refreshment she made a motion with her hand to indicate to me that it was urine and one of the old men repeated the spanish word mayar to urinate while my sense of smell demonstrated the truth of their statements the dancers swallowed great draughts smacked their lips and amid the roaring merriment of the spectators remarked that it was very very good the clowns were now upon their mettle each trying to surpass his neighbors in feats of nastiness one swallowed a fragment of corn husk saying he thought it very good and better than bread his vis-a-vis -vis attempted to chew and gulp down a piece of filthy rag another expressed regret that the dance had not been held out of doors in one of the plazas there they could show what they could do there they always made it a point of honor to eat the excrement of men and dogs for my own part i felt satisfied with the omission particularly as the room stuffed with one hundred zunis had become so foul and filthy as to be almost unbearable the dance as good luck would have it did not last many minutes and we soon had a chance to run into the refreshing night air to this outline description of a disgusting rite i have little to add the zunis in explanation stated that the nihue kue were a medicine order which held these dances from time to time to inure the stomachs of members to any kind of food no matter how revolting this statement may seem plausible enough when we understand that religion and medicine among primitive races are almost always one and the same thing or at least so closely intertwined that it is a matter of difficulty to decide where one begins and the other ends religion in its dramatic ceremonial preserves to some extent the history of the particular race in which it dwells among nations of high development miracles moralities and passion plays have taught down to our own day in object lessons the sacred history in which the spectators believed some analogous purpose may have been held in view by the first organizers of the urine dance in their early history the zunis and other pueblos suffered from constant warfare with savage antagonists and with each other from the position of their villages long sieges must of necessity have been sustained in which sieges famine and disease no doubt were the allies counted on by the investing forces we may have in this abominable dance a tradition of the extremity to which the zunis of the long ago were reduced at some unknown period a similar catastrophe in the history of the jews is intimated in two kings eighteen twenty seven quote, but rab Shaki said unto them hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words hath he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you Unquote. in the course of my studies 
I came across the reference to a very similar dance, occurring among one of the fanatical sects of the Arabian Bedouins, but the journal in which it was recorded, the London Lancet, I think, was unfortunately mislaid. As illustrative of the tenacity with which such vile ceremonial, once adopted by a sect, will adhere to it and become engrafted upon its life, long after the motives which have suggested or commended it have vanished into oblivion, let me quote a few lines from Max Muller's Chips from a German Workshop, Essay upon the Pharisees, pages 163 to 164, Scribner's Edition, 1869. Quote, the narang is the urine of cow, ox, or she-goat, and the rubbing of it over the face and hands is the second thing a parasy does after getting out of bed. Either before applying the narang to the face and hands, or while it remains on the hands after being applied, he should not touch anything directly with his hands, but in order to wash out the narang, he either asks someone else to pour water on his hands, or results to the device of taking hold of the pot through the intervention of a piece of cloth, such as a handkerchief or his sudra, i.e. his blouse. He first pours water on his hand, then takes the pot in that hand and washes his other hand, face, and feet." Unquote. Quoting from that of High Nadrosi's description of the Pharisees. Continuing, Max Muller says, quote, Strange as this process of purification may appear, it becomes perfectly disgusting when we are told that women, after childbirth, have not only to undergo this sacred ablution, but actually to drink a little of the nerang, and that the same rite is imposed on children at the time of their investiture with the suja and karshti, the badges of the Zoroastrian faith. Unquote. End of The Urine Dance of the Zuni Indians of New Mexico by Captain John G. Bork, 3rd Cavalry, U.S. Army read by Donald Cummings. Wisdom at Proper Times is Well Forgot From the Rambler by Samuel Johnson 22 January 1751 Dolce es desipere in loco Horace, Book 4, Odes, Chapter 12, Line 28 Locke, whom there is no reason to suspect of being a favorer of idleness or libertinism, has advanced that whosoever hopes to employ any part of his time with efficacy and vigor must allow some of it to pass in trifles. It is beyond the powers of humanity to spend a whole life in profound study and intense meditation. And the most vigorous exactors of industry and seriousness have appointed hours for relaxation and amusement. It is certain that, with or without our consent, many of the few moments allotted to us will slide imperceptibly away, and that the mind will break from confinement to its stated task into sudden excursions. Severe and connected attention is preserved but for a short time, and when a man shuts himself up in his closet, and bends his thoughts to the discussion of any abstruse question, he will find his faculties continually stealing away to more pleasing entertainments. He often perceives himself transported, he knows not how, to distant tracts of thought, and returns to his first object as from a dream, without knowing when he forsook it, or how long he has been abstracted from it. It has been observed that the most studious are not always the most learned, there is indeed no great difficulty in discovering that this difference of proficiency may arise from the difference of intellectual powers, of the choice of books, or the convenience of information. But I believe it likewise frequently happens that the most recluse are not the most vigorous prosecutors of study. Many impose upon the world, and many upon themselves, by an appearance of severe and exemplary diligence, when they in reality give themselves up to the luxury of fancy, please their minds with regulating the past or planning the future, place themselves at will in varied situations of happiness, and slumber away their days in voluntary visions. In the journey of life some are left behind, because they are naturally feeble and slow, some because they miss the way, 
and many because they leave it by choice, and instead of pressing onward with a steady pace, delight themselves with momentary deviations, turn aside to pluck every flower, and repose in every shade. There is nothing more fatal to a man whose business is to think than to have learned the art of regaling his mind with those airy gratifications. Other vices or follies are restrained by fear, reformed by admonition, or rejected by the conviction which the comparison of our conduct with that of others may in time produce. But this invisible riot of the mind, this secret prodigality of being, is secure from detection and fearless of reproach. The dreamer retires to his apartments, shuts out the cares and interruptions of mankind, and abandons himself to his own fancy. New worlds rise up before him. One image is followed by another, and a long succession of delights dances round him. He is at last called back to life by nature, or by custom, and enters peevish into society, because he cannot model it to his own will. He returns from his idle excursions with the asperity, though not with the knowledge of a student, and hastens again to the same felicity with the eagerness of a man bent upon the advancement of some favorite science. The infatuation strengthens by degrees, and like the poison of opiates, weakens his powers without any external symptoms of malignity. It happens indeed that these hypocrites of learning are in time detected, and convinced by disgrace and disappointment of the difference between the labor of thought and the sport of musing. But this discovery is often not made till it is too late to recover the time that has been fooled away. A thousand accidents may, indeed, awaken drones to a more early sense of their danger and their shame. But they who are convinced of the necessity of breaking from this habitual drowsiness too often relapse in spite of the resolution, for these ideal seducers are always near, and neither any particularity of time nor place is necessary to their influence. They invade the soul without warning, and have often charmed down resistance before their approach is perceived or suspected. This captivity, however, it is necessary for every man to break, who has any desire to be wise or useful, to pass his life with the esteem of others, or to look back with satisfaction from his old age upon his earlier years. In order to regain liberty, he must find the means of flying from himself. He must, in opposition to the Stoic precept, teach his desires to fix upon external things. He must adopt the joys and the pains of others, and excite in his mind the want of social pleasures and amicable communication. It is, perhaps, not impossible to promote the cure of this mental malady by close application to some new study, which may pour in fresh ideas and keep curiosity in perpetual motion. But study requires solitude, and solitude is a state dangerous to those who are too much accustomed to sink into themselves. Active employment or public pleasure is generally a necessary part of this intellectual regimen without which, though some remission may be obtained, a complete cure will scarcely be effected. This is a formidable and obstinate disease of the intellect, of which, when it has become eradicated by time, the remedy is one of the hardest tasks of reason and of virtue. Its slightest attacks, therefore, should be watchfully opposed, and he that finds the frigid and narcotic infection beginning to seize him, should turn his whole attention against it, and check it at the first discovery by proper counteraction. The great resolution to be formed, when happiness and virtue are thus formidably invaded, is that no part of life be spent in a state of neutrality or indifference, but that some pleasure be found for every moment that is not devoted to labor, and that, whenever the necessary business of life grows irksome or disgusting, an immediate transition be made to diversion and gaiety. After the exercises which the health of the body requires, and which have themselves a natural tendency to actuate and invigorate the mind, the most eligible amusement of a rational being seems to be that interchange of thoughts which is
practised in free and easy conversation, where suspicion is banished by experience, and emulation by benevolence, where every man speaks with no other restraint than unwillingness to offend, and hears with no other disposition than desire to be pleased. There may be a time in which every man trifles, and the only choice that nature offers us is to trifle in company or alone. To join profit with pleasure, it has been an old precept among men who have had very different conceptions of profit. All have agreed that our amusements should not terminate wholly in the present moment, but contribute more or less to future advantage. He that amuses himself among well-chosen companions can scarcely fail to receive from the most careless and obstreperous merriment which virtue can allow some useful hints nor can converse on the most familiar topics without some casual information the loose sparkles of thoughtless wit may give new light to the mind and the gay contention for paradoxical positions rectify the opinions this is the time in which those friendships that give happiness or consolation relief or security are generally formed. A wise and good man is never so amiable as in his unbended and familiar intervals. Heroic generosity or philosophical discoveries may compel veneration and respect, but love always implies some kind of natural or voluntary equality, and is only to be excited by that levity and cheerfulness which disencumber all minds from awe and solicitude invite the modest to freedom and exalt the timorous to confidence this easy gaiety is certain to please whatever be the character of him that exerts it if our superiors descend from their elevation we love them for lessening the distance at which we are placed below them and inferiors from whom we can receive no lasting advantage will always keep our affections while their sprightliness and mirth contribute to our pleasure Every man finds himself differently affected by the sight of fortresses of war and palaces of pleasure. We look on the height and strength of the bulwarks with a kind of gloomy satisfaction, for we cannot think of defense without admitting images of danger, but we range delighted and jocund through the gay apartments of the palace, because nothing is impressed by them on the mind but joy and festivity. Such is the difference between great and amiable characters. With protectors we are safe, with companions we are happy. End of the Luxury of Vain Imagination by Samuel Johnson The Yellowstone Expedition of 1871 From Ferdinand van de Veer Hayden and the Founding of the Yellowstone National Park by the United States Department of the Interior Geological Survey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Among those who played key roles in establishing Yellowstone as the nation's first national park was Ferdinand Vandeveer Hayden. His accomplishments in 1871-72 were the highlights of a long and distinguished career in public service. Although born in Westfield, Massachusetts, on September 7, 1829, Hayden was raised by an uncle on a farm in Rochester, New York. Following an unusually studious boyhood, he began teaching school when he was 16 years old. However, he quickly became discontented with what he considered an inadequate education, and after two years of teaching, made his way to Oberlin, Ohio. There, although virtually penniless, he persuaded the president of Oberlin College to allow him to enroll in medical school. While at Oberlin, Hayden formed a close association with a young geologist named John Strong Newberry, who urged Hayden to pursue his studies under his own former teacher, James Hall of Albany, New York. Soon after, Hayden enrolled in Albany Medical College, and although he graduated as a doctor of medicine in 1853, 
it is during this time that his interest in geology was fostered under the influence of professor hall shortly after graduating hayden set out on his first geological expedition under the sponsorship of hall accompanied by the paleontologist fielding bradford meek hayden headed up the missouri river to explore the dakota badlands and to collect fossil specimens returning in eighteen fifty four he and meek began to acquire reputations of their own and as a team they added significant geological information to what was known about the nation's western frontier during the war between the states hayden practiced medicine for the only time in his career serving with the union army as a surgeon following the war he received his first academic degree in geology when he was appointed professor of geology and mineralogy at the university of pennsylvania in eighteen sixty five a post he held mainly in absentia for the next seven years during this period hayden spent much of his time studying and reporting on the geology of the nebraska territory and rocky mountain region in 1869 hayden completed a highly successful expedition through the western mountains from denver to santa fe this expedition set the pattern for those to follow for his team studied virtually all natural phenomena which they encountered including wildlife plant life water resources and mineral deposits the yellowstone area was almost the last unexplored area within conterminous united states when hayden led his expedition into the area in eighteen seventy one westward migration had passed it by and even the discovery of gold in nearby montana failed to stimulate the exploration of yellowstone general james wilkinson had reported the existence of the area to president thomas jefferson in eighteen o five rumors about the area had reached hayden during his lonely exploration of the upper missouri country in the eighteen fifties an army expedition under captain william f reynold of which hayden was geologist in charge failed to get through the snow-filled passes of the surrounding mountains in the eighteen sixties this latter failure served to whet hayden's desire to explore this region where quotes hell spouted up end quotes hayden's historic expedition into the yellowstone area in eighteen seventy one was preceded by two expeditions which fired the imagination of those interested in that largely unknown region the Folsom cook group penetrated the yellowstone country in eighteen sixty nine followed by the washburn langford doan expedition in eighteen seventy lieutenant gustavus c doan who served as the leader of the military escort for this latter expedition filed a detailed report which was published as a congressional document and became a landmark of the yellowstone story the following is taken from his report Quote, we kept the yellowstone to our left and finding the canyon impassable passed over several high spurs coming down from the mountains over which the way was much obstructed by fallen timber and reached at an elevation of seven thousand three hundred and thirty one feet an immense rolling plateau extending as far as the eye could reach this elevated slope of country is about thirty miles in extent with a general declivity to the northward its surface is an undulated prairie dotted with groves of pine and aspen numerous lakes are scattered throughout its whole extent and great numbers of springs which flow down the slopes and are lost in the volume of the yellowstone the river breaks through this plateau in a winding and impassable canyon of trachyte lava over two thousand feet in depth the middle canyon of the yellowstone rolling over volcanic boulders in some places and in others forming still pools of seemingly fathomless depth at one point it dashes here and there lashed to a white foam upon its rocky bed 
at another it subsides into a crystal mirror wherever a deep basin occurs in the channels numerous small cascades are seen tumbling from the lofty summits a mere ribbon of foam in the immeasurable distance below this huge abyss through walls of flinty lava has not been worn away by the waters for no trace of fluvial agency is left upon the rocks it is cleft in the strata brought about by volcanic action plainly shown by that irregular structure which gives such a ragged appearance to all such igneous formations standing on the brink of the chasm the heavy roaring of the imprisoned river comes to the ear in a sort of hollow hungry growl scarcely audible from the depths and strongly suggestive of demons in torment below lofty pines on the bank of the stream dwindle to shrubs in dizziness of distance everything beneath has a weird and deceptive appearance the water does not look like water but like oil numerous fish hawks are seen busily plying their vocation sailing high above the waters and yet a thousand feet below the spectator in the clefts of the rocks hundreds of feet down bald eagles have their aries from which we can see them swooping still further into the depths to rob the ospreys of their hard-earned trout it is grand gloomy and terrible a solitude peopled with fantastic ideas an empire of shadows and of turmoil End quote. spurred on by these accounts hayden organized his yellowstone expedition with the support of a forty thousand dollar appropriation from congress in early june 1871 a team of 34 men and seven wagons set out from ogden utah among the group were geologist and executive officer of the expedition james stevenson mineralogist a c peel topographer antoine schoenborn artists henry w elliott and thomas moran and photographer william h jackson the latter two proved to be invaluable to the expedition for their paintings and photographs served as dramatic and effective testimonials in favor of establishing the park after several weeks of travel the hayden expedition reached boatler's ranch in the yellowstone valley there they were joined by the barlow heap military party of engineer explorers who planned a reconnaissance of the upper yellowstone this latter group intermittently explored with the hayden expedition during the next several weeks the results of their explorations were published as a senate document which contributed to the material eventually used in helping to establish the yellowstone national park the joint hayden barlow heap expedition departed from boatlers on july twentieth eighteen seventy one the wagons and extra supplies were abandoned at boatlers and the remaining gear packed on mules progress was slow and the difficulty of moving through the dense forest was compounded by the great number of trees felled by fires that periodically swept the region there was always the danger of indian attack or of being separated from the main party and becoming lost in the uncharted wilds the yellowstone basin however proved to be an ideal open-air laboratory because the area is foremost a geological area containing an extraordinary variety of natural features including important clues to mountain making and volcanic processes each of the scientists accompanying the expedition found unique opportunities for observation and study hayden recorded his thoughts as his party advanced up the river Quote, but the objects of the deepest interest in this region are the falls and the grand canyon of the yellowstone i will attempt to convey some idea by a description but it is only through the eye that the mind can gather anything like an adequate conception of them 
but no language can do justice to the wonderful grandeur and beauty of the canyon below the lower falls the very nearly vertical walls slightly sloping down to the water's edge on either side so that from the summit the river appears like a thread of silver foaming over its rocky bottom the variegated colors of the sides yellow red brown white all intermixed and shading into each other the gothic columns of every form standing out from the sides of the walls with greater variety and more striking colors than ever adorned a work of human art end quote. hayden continued to describe the falls quote, standing near the margin of the lower falls and looking down the canyon with its sides 1200 to 1500 feet high and decorated with the most brilliant colors that the human eye ever saw with the rocks weathered into an almost unlimited variety of forms the whole presents a picture that would be difficult to surpass in nature End quote. Quote, from any point of view the upper falls are most picturesque and striking the entire volume of water seems to be as it were hurled off the precipice with the force which it has accumulated in the rapids above so that the mass is detached into the most beautiful snow-white bead-like drops and as it strikes the rocky basin below it shoots through the water with a sort of ricochet for the distance of 200 feet End quote. of the yellowstone itself hayden said quote, the river by its width its beautiful curves and easy flow moves on down towards its wonderful precipices with a majestic motion that would charm the eye of an artist End quote. however not all was majestic beauty for there was also the power and mystery of the geysers and the grotesque forms of the hot mud springs hayden described these phenomena such as one geyser he named the grotto quote, a vast column of steam issues from a cavern in the side of the hill with an opening about five feet in diameter the roaring of the waters in the caverns and the noise of the waters as they surge up to the mouth of the opening are like that of the billows lashing the seashore the water is as clear as crystal and the steam is so hot that it is only when the breeze wafts it aside for a moment one can venture to take a look at the opening End quote. Quote, located higher up on the side of the hill not far from the grotto is the most remarkable mud spring we have ever seen in the west it may not improbably be called the giant's cauldron it does not boil with an impulse like most of the mud springs but with a constant roar which shakes the ground for a considerable distance and may be heard for half a mile all the indications around this most remarkable cauldron show it has broken out at a recent period End quote examining the mud springs and geysers was hazardous business and could be a painful experience as hayden discovered quote, the entire surface is perfectly bare of vegetation and hot yielding in many places to slight pressure i attempted to walk about among these simmering vents and broke through to my knees covering myself with hot mud to my great pain and subsequent inconvenience End quote. finally the expedition reached yellowstone lake the focal point of their exploration causing hayden to remark quote, on the 28th of july we arrived at the lake and pitched our camp on the northeast shore in a beautiful grassy meadow or opening among the dense pines the lake lay before us a vast sheet of quiet water of a most delicate ultramarine hue one of the most beautiful scenes i have ever beheld the entire party was filled with enthusiasm the great object of our labors has been reached and we were amply paid for all our toils such a vision is worth a lifetime 
and only one of such marvelous beauty will ever greet the human eye. From whatever point of view one may behold it, it presents a unique picture. End quote. Hayden's party split into groups, with some continuing to explore the perimeter of the lake, while Hayden, Schoenborn, and other members of the expedition went on toward the geyser basin of the Fire Hole River. Here, Hayden and his party examined several geysers and, quote, boiling springs, end quote, and gave them names such as Thud Geyser, Mud Puff, Architectural Fountain, Catfish, The Bathtub, Dental Cup, Punch Bowl Number no. 2, and Beehive. Impressed with the geologic spectacles he saw, Hayden continued to make scientific observations. Describing the fire hole river's geyser basin, quote, south of the thud geyser, as laid down on the chart, there is one large basin, 150 feet in diameter, with a crater within the rim 25 feet in diameter. From this, an entire mass of water is thrown up 30 to 60 feet, falling back into it in detached globules like silver. There is a rim around the inner crater three feet high. The vast column of water as it shoots up spreads out in falling back like a natural fountain, so that it overflows the inner rim for a radius of ten feet. A short distance south of the fountain geyser is one of the most remarkable mud pots in the Firehole Valley. The diameter within the rim is 40 to 60 feet and forms a vast mortar bed of finest material. The surface is covered with large puffs and as each one bursts, the mud spurts upward several feet with a suppressed thud. The mud is an impalpable salacious clay, fine enough it would seem, for the manufacture of the choicest wear. The colors are of every shade, from the purest white to a bright rich pink. The surface is covered with 20 or 30 of these puffs, which are bursting each second, tossing the mud in every direction onto the broad, rounded rim. There are several other mud puffs in the vicinity, but they do not differ materially from the last except in size. Within a few feet of the mud springs, there is a large clear spring, 40 to 60 feet, with perhaps 50 centers of ebullition, filled with the rusty leathery deposit. And all around the basin where the waters overflow, there is an extensive deposit of the iron. The temperature is 140 degrees. About one-fourth of a mile west of the large mud pots are some extensive fissure springs one of them 100 feet long and of variable width, 4 to 10 feet. These appear to be merely openings in the crust or deposit which covers the entire surface. Quite a large stream flows from this spring. Many of the springs seem to remain full to the rim of the crater and are in a continual state of greater or less ebullition, and yet no water flows from them. Others discharge great quantities, the aggregate of the surplus water usually forms a good-sized stream, as is shown on the map. In this group are a few springs that have precipitated a small amount of sulfur, the first observed in the Fire Hole Valley. Silica and iron seem to be the dominant constituent in nearly all the deposits. There are numerous springs that deposit a curious black sediment, like fine gunpowder, and send forth a very disagreeable odor. Continuing explorations were carried on by some members performing detailed surveys and others pushing into the valley to explore the upper Yellowstone River. The east fork of the river was traversed and Mounts Doan and Stevenson were ascended. Eventually, after having spent 38 days in the wilderness, the entire party arrived back at Boatler's Ranch. There they packed their wagons and after leaving retraced their route to Fort Hall. Then they traveled eastward aboard the Union Pacific to Evanston, Illinois, 
where the party disbanded on October 1st, 1871. The most important product of the expedition, in addition to Jackson's photos, was a 500-page report by Hayden detailing the findings of his party. Hayden presented this report, Jackson's photos, and Moran's sketches and paintings to senators, congressmen, his superiors in the Interior Department, and nearly anyone else who could possibly influence the founding of a park. He also wrote articles in magazines with national circulation and spent much personal time and effort in trying to convince Congress to establish the park. On December 18, 1871, a bill was introduced simultaneously in the Senate by Senator S. C. Pomeroy of Kansas and in the House of Representatives by Congressman W. H. Claggett of Montana for the establishment of a park at the headwaters of the Yellowstone River. The bill in each case was referred to the respective committees on public lands. Upon reporting the bill back to the Senate on January 22, 1872, Senator Pomeroy advised that body, quote, Professor Hayden and party have been there, and this bill is drawn on the recommendation of that gentleman to consecrate for public uses this country for a public park. End of the Yellowstone Expedition of 1871 From Ferdinand Van de Veer Hayden and the Founding of the Yellowstone National Park By the United States Department of the Interior Geological Survey Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson